Hello and welcome to the fifth in our series of sessions on AI, neuroscience and architecture. This is a series looking at the emerging theory of intelligence um, that is emerging at the intersection between, between the dis different disciplines of AI, neuroscience and architecture. Um, today I'm delighted to um, have Ben Bratton here. I will say in a few other words before I actually introduce him. First of all, to say that this is a part of the uh, doctoral consortium um, uh, initiative that launched by Digital Futures to try and share educational ideas worldwide. The idea is to, that education should be a human right and not a privilege of the rich, and we're trying to extend these ideas to everyone throughout the globe. Um, <clears throat> this, I should also say that uh, uh, Digital Futures and a number of other talks coming up in the, in the, in the next few days. This is a series on biodesign in Latin America that's happening on Friday. Uh, we had one um, um, uh, from the Ara in Arabic on, on um, yesterday, and on Sunday of next uh, Saturday of next week, we also have a, a session coming from Africa. So there's a whole series of different languages now that we're we're launching, and in March we we hope to have our first ever session in Portuguese. Um, the all these sessions are going to be uploaded onto. Um, <clears throat> our YouTube library. Um, I've shown you just a few of them, uh, the two, two of the series here, AI, Neuroscience and Architecture, where you can find all the previous sessions available for free. Um, there's also a series on architecture and philosophy that proved to be, both of which have been proved to be very, very popular. And alongside these, there are also sessions, uh, tutorials on, on technical um, tools and so on, and uh, design uh, tutorial and uh, design sessions. Um, they're all uploaded. If you take a screen capture, you can find it on our YouTube library, the address at the bottom of the page here. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, the fifth of the series. Uh, there are five more to come. Um, next week, I'm delighted to have Jeff Hawkins, um, whose, whose book, A Thousand Brains, in many ways inspired this uh, series, A New Theory of Intelligence, um, followed by Antonio Damasio. We actually haven't confirmed the date for that, but uh, he is, he's agreed to come. Um, then we have Daniel Bollajam, um, one of the leading architects working in the area of, of AI. Um, followed by Su Susan Schneider, a philosopher, uh, the author of the book Artificial You, and uh, Andy Clark, the cognitive scientist um, uh, who has been collaborating both with uh, David Chalmers, whom we had two weeks ago, um, and also with Anand Seth. Um, uh, so um, today it's really a great pleasure to be to introduce uh, Benjamin Bratton. He's somebody that I've known and admired for some time. We first met, I think it was at the, the Nike Blue House on Venice Beach, which happens to be about 40 meters away from where I am now, right now. And the Nike Blue House, in many ways, kind of epitomizes the West Coast. It, it moved from Nike to becoming a, a marijuana dispensary to becoming the place where Snapchat was founded. And uh, I can recall um, Ben introducing me to the event that he was hosting there, saying, welcome to Theory West Coast Style. And I think we'll have a bit of Theory West Coast Style today. Um, but Ben has been really a central figure, um, a central figure in intellectual circles worldwide. But fortunately for us in architecture, he's also been involved in architecture um, the whole time. Let me just say that there, his two most famous books, uh, uh, at least as far as I'm aware, um, are The Stack, I think 2015, a book that, that uh, on the, the accidental megastructure, uh, this informational, this planetary informational system, a book that I find extremely useful. I and then more recently, and then more recently, <clears throat> The Revenge of the Real, um, a book written after the, about the pandemic, um, which has also proved very popular. Perhaps some other people um, may be aware of this extraordinary thing, which I think is really quintessentially Ben, the, the, his uh, TEDx talk, his anti TEDx talk, which is, you know, delightful, provocative, um, in a way that I think, you know, is matches the, his whole style. Um, uh, 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 but to actually say who Ben is, I put together a collage of different sort of photographs from different posts that he has on the web, is quite a challenge. And um, he has a PhD um, in, I would say, uh, the philosophy of technology um, from the sociology department of UC Santa Barbara. But he's also been, he's also the, uh, has a post at UC San Diego here on the bottom left, where he is uh, in an art school. Um, he uh, famously has been a part of SIARC for um, many years, um, and he's been director of, uh, of Strelka in recent years, I mean, a, a school of architecture in Moscow, where he succeeded Rem Kohlhaas. Um, he's also been part of the European Graduate School, a school of philosophy, 
where he's been uh, been professor of digital design for some time, and I have I was partly responsible for, for that point. Um, and finally, uh, he's also been part of NYU um, Shanghai, where he's been um, a central figure um, within this within within the world of of, of AI in, as part of the Center for for AI and Culture. Um, so he has these many different posts. I mean, I don't think anybody's had quite so many posts simultaneously uh, in all the different sort of areas. But that many is that sums up his kind of intellectual terrain. That uh, a kind of he covers a lot of territory. But fortunately for us in architecture, um, he's been a kind of a central part of the discussion. Um, today uh, he will be talking. On, this is a kind of segue in some ways to the, 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 the idea that maybe Ben has been cloned himself and a segue into the conversation today about uh, simulation and, and uh, repetition. But it's a great, it's a great honor to have you here Ben today. I, I'm uh, delighted that we, we, we were able to have you and uh, let's, I will hand the floor over to Ben and we will uh, uh, have a presentation. Then I'll follow up with a few questions and I'll invite questions from the audience both on Zoom and YouTube. So if you have any questions um, on YouTube, please send them into the chat and we will uh, feed them from there. So welcome, welcome Benjamin Ratton. <clears throat> thank you, Neil, for the, the uh, thank you, Neil, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I think it was, I, I think maybe Nike Blue House, I think maybe earlier at Sire, I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but uh, um, uh, anyway, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be part of the extraordinary lineup of, of of people that you that you have in this series people of what looks like the books the re, the current reading stack of books next to my uh on my bedstand is looks a lot like the the list of, of speakers for this series and so i'm both delighted and slightly intimidated to be in the in their uh, in their company on, on the series i will um the talk that I prepared today, um, I want to give a little bit of a caveat right at the start is sort of new work. Um, the, the present project, book, major book project that I'm working on right now is, uh, will be sort of the follow up to the stack, um, probably equally, um, equally voluminous, um, 500 plus pages was, was the stack. Um, if the stack was a book, the way I, I sort of thinking about it at the moment, if the stack was a book that was about what, what planetary scale computation is, this next book will be about what planetary scale, planetary scale computation is for, uh, what its purpose is, what its structures, uh, not, just, not just as they are, but in, perhaps in fact as they might be uh, and they should be. Um, now, to the extent to which computation at this point um, as an infrastructural system refers not simply to a certain kind of type of machine or type of technology, but um, uh, increasingly has become, um, as I'll try to discuss a little bit in the, uh, in, the in this particular context, what, it, what I call after the work of Stanislaw Lem, uh, an epistemological technology. That is, its function is not just in what it allows us to do, uh, but in fact, how in its employment and deployment, it reveals or discloses fundamental um, qualities of, of the world or fundamental qualities really of, of, of the planet, a planetary condition um, that would otherwise have been uh, occluded or, or obscured. And that in the long run, um, these processes may be its, 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 real, its real function and purpose. Now, within that, Within that framework, um, the book uh, has is basically broken into two sections of premises and and um, domains. Let's say there's two premises around planetarity, uh, a theory of planetarity and a theory of the artificial. Uh, what constitutes the artificial per se? And there's four domains in which this is worked through. One that refers specifically to uh, synthetic intelligence is a term I prefer that over artificial intelligence. Uh, one on planetary governance, one on extraplanetarity, and one on uh, what is we're calling in for as a placeholder name of synthetic biopolitics. Now, within that, there is a discussion of the production of modes of synthetic sensing, so which inclusive of machine vision uh, 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 and so and, and so forth. Um, and Within this also then constitutes an under, a, a, a sort of a longer discussion of the question of, of simulations, of simulated realities, simulated environments, simulation stuff. And so that's the 
the sort of, so if you imagine this is sort of the large book in smaller sections and then chapters and chapters, what I want to present to you today is sort of recent work from one little thread within this long, much, much larger stream, which is about, as Neil indicated, simulations. Now, the way in which we may want to enter, uh, enter into this, and, and I'll invite your uh, invite your curiosity uh, and your uh, suspension of disbelief to a certain extent, is to think about simulations uh, in two ways. Uh, one is, uh, the, currently we may sort of juxtapose an understanding of simulations in relation to virtual reality, augmented reality, XR, and so forth on the one hand, uh, and scientific simulations on the other. Um, part of the argument that is to understand simulations as an epistemological technology, we need to understand a conjoining of these two, of, of simulations in the experiential sense and simulations in the scientific sense as a kind of common pursuit. The, the second area, which is actually what I'm going to be focusing more on today, is to try to recast the history, let's say the philosophical history of simulation and particularly of shadows and doubling as a way of understanding this more contemporary uh, conjoining of, of these two of these two modes of simulation. So with that, let me simply begin my remarks and then we can get to the much more interesting part of our of our time together, which will be the discussion. <clears throat> First, let's then I want to introduce the uh, uh, this uh, sort of seemingly obvious question of what are shadows uh, of, of which we might take as a kind of primordial form of doubling, a primordial form of twinning, uh, but one that has a extremely interesting and fraught philosophical um, history. The, 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 the remarks that I'm going to also sort of present today come from a, a piece that I just wrote for a catalog for a, a show by he, the German artist Hito Steirl, um, and whose work, as you are probably aware, focuses a lot on issues of digital identity, digital shadows, how the, 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 pro, the, the doubles that we produce uh, in the context of the social context of planetary scale computation come to take on an agency of their own. So there is already a kind of dynamic between um, the self and the shadow here as well. Now, part of what I want to suggest is that the, this particular dynamic is maybe we can see more of an extrapolation of a more fundamental one. That is, um, an object can be seen by any entity that's capable of vision through, of course, the reflection of light. But this reflection is also a kind of filtering uh, of the same light so that it can't reach whatever is on the other side of the object. This produces an artifact, which can be interpreted as both a kind of subtractive absence um, and as a new kind of thing uh, in its own right with significant but sometimes incomplete attachment to this filtering object whose profile it resembles. The secondary void slash object is what we call a shadow. It tracks the object from which it seems to be projected but also changes in shape and size in ways the original object can't. At times, the shadow appears as a dark two-dimensional replica of the object. But if, for example, the source of, life is, source of light is closer to the ground, then the shadow bends and elongates, and in doing so, seems to take on a formal identity of its own, different from the object. So a, a time-seasoned trope uh, that crisscrosses platonic metaphysics, why and cool it shadow puppetry, and animated children's cartoons all the same, is the potential for the shadow to, in essence, swap places with the original object in terms of cause and effect, uh, a kind of confusion of ordination. Sometimes the shadow even delinks from the object altogether or, or interacts with it as a seemingly as a kind of self-sovereign equal. Plato's allegory of the cave uh, is itself a theory of simulation at the core of Western philosophy um, and is concerned, as we know, not simply with shadows misperceived as primary objects, but with the prospect that what we take to be everyday objects are themselves really a kind of shadow of yet more primary forms. This worry haunts the ongoing critical suspicion of phenomenal appearances and what does and does not constitute the correspondence between image, truth, and reality. 
Shadow puppetry uh, may stage a similar kind of dilemma, but one that does so by inverting that allegory, the platonic allegory um, of what, what is the real in the, in the simulation. I, I, among my um, favorite memories of my mis misspent youth is uh, attending late night epic dramas told with shadow puppets in the open air temples of in the Javanese city of Jakarta back in the mid 1990s, where crowds of people would wander in and out would share tall bottles of beer and various snacks as the seven, six or seven or eight hour epic would unfold and cycle back around again and start over and over until dawn light appears. This particular cave uh, accessed, accessed the agency of the shadow perhaps more directly uh, and presents them not as a deceptive illusions, but as direct presentations of the fundamental mythic systems that underlie daytime reality, but which are otherwise obscured by it. Anyone who spent their childhood watching cartoons can half remember, remember or half remember characters peeling off their own shadow, giving, moving their shadow to a different spot, dancing a duet with their shadow, boxing with their shadow, and so on. The allegories at play here are perhaps less metaphysical than psychological. Generally, they are similar to the dilemmas posed by a mirror reflection uh, in which self is recognized as an exterior object. And specifically, they play with the potential uh, of, with a potentially horrifying loss of self-control or perhaps control over the external or perhaps loss of, uh, over the external effects of one's thoughts um, or, or the, our emotions or actions. To box with one's shadow is to be of two minds about something with existential consequences. To peel off one's shadow, to fold it up into a suitcase as, one, as a cartoon cat once did, is to decouple oneself from those consequences of agency, or at least to enact the feeling that such agency is already decoupled. So let me then move to another kind of shadow, another kind of doubling. Um, that, that also speaks to the, uh, the, the kind of counter agency between the thing and its simulation, or the thing as simulation, and that is subtitling. Subtitling a movie um, is a related process then of doubling and shadowing. It's a doubling not of a tangible object optically, but of a voice and of, semant of the semantic content contained the principle within that voice. It is the transposition of that semantic meaning contained in the sound of a voice, not only into a different language, uh, but into a different modality of thought, that is, into written text. A subtitle is then also a kind of shadow, um, but in its secondary relation to the image, uh, it can also be easily categorized, perhaps, if we like, as a genre of the caption. Now, a written caption um, to an image may describe how it was made, who made it, when it was made, how big it is, uh, what happened to it over the lifetime of a con as a contested artifact. And in the accumulation of these meta significations, the caption may also describe what's happening in the image itself and implicitly even its meaning. So there is then a spectrum of captions, if you like. On the one hand, some describe the image only in comparative measurements, date, width, length, while others uh, are more like subtitles in that they transpose the otherwise incommunicable meaning of what the viewer sees. The latter may come in the form of, for example, an ambitious curatorial statement presented alongside the image or an accommodation of accessibility that would, for example, describe the image for a blind museum view visitor. And in, in, in practice, the difference between the former and the latter may itself be uncertain. To be sure then, there is considerable power in this doubling and in the translation and direction of what something or someone is and what it means. 
unlike the shadow, which doubles the originary, the original unconsciously, if also mischievously, the subtitle makes the implicit into the explicit. The angry sounding movie character, it's not just yelling angry sounds, but specific angry words. The dazzling painting is not just kinetic and vibrant, but seen through the filter of that curatorial statement turns out to be about, for example, the brutality of World War I. Now, and this is where I want to spend a little bit of time on this question of what we call augmented reality, um, having set, having presented a particular theory of the shadow and the subtitle, to consider the, what we mean by augmented reality and what we may want to extrapolate uh, and produce and consider philosophically in relationship to extant and proposed augmented reality technologies, to see them uh, as a kind, as these as a kind of shadowing, as a kind of doubling, uh, as a kind of subtitling of the world uh, and all that that may bring with it, particularly the ways in which it may concentrate many uh, already existing critical slippages between person and object, model, and agency. So to ask that question is to ask uh, more concisely, what is what augments what exactly in this augmentation of reality? Now, to, to sort of start with the baseline, let me um, say that I'm in this case, I'm defining AR, augmented reality, um, in reference to two, two things. Then we may speak of them simultaneously or separately. The first one is then, as I say, the specific set of existing and emerging technologies that interact with what a person uh, sees most, most often, though it could be any other senses, but interact with what a person sees by, by introducing additional optical artifacts which frame their field of view and or which have some direct semiotic relation to the objects and events in the scenario that is thus framed. And also, two, uh, it would also refer to the phenomenological experience of perceiving the world as the scenario that is filled with objects which may be given this artificial primary or secondary semiotic relation with one another. So it is both the technology that makes this scenarioization of reality possible, but it would also refer to the, uh, the, the, this, the, the reality that is thus produced at the same time. It is both the technology of artificial perception of reality and the reality that the technology artificializes. Now, um, the term is primarily used, uh, in, as I say, in relationship to visual media technologies, but could just as well refer to augmented auditory, tactile, taste, or olfactory realities. For example, a blind person may come to rely on AR technologies, which either provide an alternative medium of vision um, or which augment their other senses. The difference may be more philosophical <clears throat> than <clears throat> excuse me, as then technical as it turns out. <clears throat> Sorry. From another perspective, <clears throat> AR is a kind of autonomic spoofing, um, a deliberate introduction of, in essence, of, of decoys uh, and false positives into one's own sensory experience. You know that what you're looking at isn't real, uh, but you act as if it is. And so it works as a kind of um, inverse hallucination, let's say. Now, the most conventional genres of AR uh, involve the attachment of indexes, signs and symbols to objects in the field of view. A chair may now have a virtual creature sitting in it. The space at arm's length may now be filled uh, with a virtual desktop. The stranger you meet in the street may now arrive with a platform enabled pre-interpretation of the character as friend or enemy. New layers of reality are added to this stage and existing things appear along with their digital twins such that the interpretive space between the object and the shadow partially collapses. A person knows consciously that this augmented animal, vegetable, or mineral that they see is not really like that, 
But the effect of being in the moment of this reel allows for the same kind of motivated forgetting that a viewer of a subtitled film might employ. The latter knows that the little yellow words in italics are not actually floating in front of the characters within the diegetic space of the film, and yet losing oneself in the flow of the story also means collapsing the voice heard and the text seen into a shared rhythm. Now, this distinction between the real and the unreal or, or, or meta-real uh, or merely simulated is not always so cut and dry. Of late, several philosophers, David Chalmers included, uh, uh, who, you just, who you recently heard from, um, have reapproached the status of simulation via AR's cousin, virtual reality. They ask, in what ways does the brain perceive VR uh, as, in essence, third-person representations uh, of, of the world, the way in which we might view a painting or, or, or a photograph, or versus uh, an experience of it as a visceral, visceral first-hand experience. It would seem the, that it's a bit of both. Uh, designer Keiichi Matsuda, uh, whose work you saw in the last slide, um, and whose cinematic visualizations have established an extremely high bar for what AR experiences may enable for better and worse, uh, considers this animated shadowing of perceived objects in AR uh, as what he calls a new form of animism, whereby objects are imbued with new kinds of implicit or explicit agency and personality. Now for him, this animism would be a positive and perhaps even spiritual development, but like all forms of animism, the attribution of agency personhood and narrative meaning to animals or objects also leads to cascades of motivated errors and solipsistic misjudgments. Uh, it, it can be in essence, a kind of maximalization of a anth anthro anthropomorphic projection. The collapse then of the real and the imagined uh, is, as, is also a matter, is a matter of cognition, uh, not just technology and of interpretation. Now, as I suggested at the outset of, of my remarks um, of, of, around AR, the augmentation of the object with su supplemental interpretive semiotics um, is exemplary uh, of a more of more fundamental social infrastructural of a more fundamental social infrastructural phenomenon of digital twinning, uh, of which digital identity, a personal digital identity is a subgenre whereby people and things are continuously modeled in relation, in relation to their qualities and actions, such that the model serves as an interface to the person and object for the outside world. It is the interface through which the outside world interacts with the person as an object, not just the other way around. For example, when the user of an AR system is observing the framed scenario and co-interpreting it along with layers of augmented shadows and subtitles, they are also themselves being modeled as a user and their actions within this scenario help build the aggregate profile that individuates each of our digital shadows. This doubling is a translation layer, if you like, between the individuated person and the model that indexes their activities in the past and organizes the range of actions they might take in the present by predicting what they are most likely to do in the future. The natural relation between the person and their shadow is thus complicated by this programmatic recursion. Now, one's agency is both the cause and the effect, if you like, of their digital shadow. And while the digital shadow slash profile frames someone's scope of action, both causing it and being in turn affected by it, um, this introduces the, uh, the sort of baseline condition by which an AR, an object is personified through its shadow augmentation while, uh, while via platform profiling, a person is objectified by their own doubling. Each, the, the user, the person and the object is then a specific instance of a more general phenomenon of digital twinning 
and personalized simulation, which locates the agency of the person and object alike. The person becomes the object, the object becomes the person. So like shadow play, for which the object and the shadow may each stand in for the real, the interaction is not simply a direct doubling in any one direction, but an active co-contextualization that may be simultaneously expressive, affective, logistical, manipulative, or weirdly liberating. <clears throat> I want then, since I began this, my little presentation talking about planetary scale computation as an infrastructural phenomenon, um, one that uh, uh, draws together numerous locations into uh, co-contextualizing realities. Um, I, I want to then speak to the infrastructures that, to a certain extent, that make uh, these modes of doubling possible, um, but which th themselves uh, become an instance of this mode of doubling. Um, they are both, so again, they are both the infrastructure that makes this doubling possible to the level of personal experience and are themselves a phenom uh, an example of this mode of doubling and of simulation. Um, that is to say, put differently, if boxing with your own shadow may seem very personal and private, but it's also a massively distributed infrastructural undertaking. It enrolls entire cities and hemispheres into the loop. So, you and I, and everyone, we have doubles. Actually, we have several of them. They live in caves and in warehouses, but not too far from here. They are grown from models of our actions, allegiances, and aspirations. Ultimately, whole cities are built to curate and cater to these doubles. These shadow cities are located in the regional shade of our great vertical metropoles. They tend to be flat, wide, and even subterranean, located in the anonymous capitals like Prineville, Oregon, Forest City, North Carolina, Altoona, Iowa, Bluffdale, Utah, Ashburn, Virginia, and of course, Las Vegas. The macroeconomics of the user profile requires an urban substrate. From, and for my culture, this means prioritizing investment in palaces of personas. So what is and what should, and what should, so the question that this poses among other things is what is and what should be the relation between the city and its shadow? What is and should be the relation between someone and their twins and triplets in this real life multiverse? The latter depends on the contingencies on, uh, of how our respective cities construct those relationships. First, the stage, then the actors, in other words. At stake is finally what the person in the mirror sees when they look at you. What is and is not placed uh, and what counts as placed as diverse locations are linked together as a matter of course. And increasingly how states not only depend on the governance of model simulations, but how governance becomes the production and exercise of pri proprietary simulations. So long before the cloud, the history of cities has included both built and unbuilt imaginary ideals. And the oscillation between the model and the modeled is not new, but there is a difference I think between building a city as a realization of a model and building a simulation as the realization of the city. Sometimes the city and its simulation are kept at a strict artificial distance from one another, not unlike the physically interweaving, but phenomenologically distinct twin cities of Bechel and Okuma in China Mieville's novel, The City and the City. Inhabitants of each may rub shoulders, but are in a way trained to be blind to each other's presence and passage. At other times, they collapse into one another directly. As you pass through a security gateway, perhaps at an airport, what is under inspection is not only your physical person, but also the trace personas linked to you, but which live in one of those near distant shadow cities. If the man in the uniform lets you pass, it's because a decision was made according to risk models on those silhouettes 
of which your physical person is the reflection. Your ears may burn as the infrastructure whispers your, about your doubles, but it's in fact not you put in play. At the same time, we might say that the whole city in a way governs itself according to its own simulation. There's not then just one double, but multiple competing doubles. Some are corporate platforms, some are state platforms. Most are mixtures of state and private to different degrees. But crucially, they do not all resolve into one final map. And so you have twins uh, of many of them, and twins of many of them uh, all at once layered on top of each other, not only interacting with you, but with one another. And so perhaps this, this multiplication of partial simulations layered, as I say, on top of one another, um, this one concerned about security, that one about advertising, that one about traffic efficiency, is in fact what prevents this fragile idealism of, of any one model becoming too dominant because there are too many other ones for it to possibly subordinate. However, um, that all persona models may be linked to you um, will also not resolve uh, into any uh, single identity on your behalf. Especially here, you may be the object that casts the shadow, but you are also not whole uh, because there are too many shadows and traces uh, to be managed. This um, leads me then to a consideration of, of the moments by which the, this question of the, 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 the prioritization, if you like, of the, of the trace in relationship to the cities um, sometimes bends into extraordinarily, extraordinary new effects. Uh, as we, we're all aware to various degrees, the extraordinary economic growth in China over the last decades uh, also brought with it a new genre of ghost cities. Places like the Kangbashi district of Ordos, the Yuji Pao financial district near Tianjin, or the Meishi Lake development near Chongsha, which stood ready for occupation um, that sometimes came eventually and sometimes didn't come at all. These two, I think, are a kind of shadow city, a different kind of shadow city, one-to-one uh, -one scale models of speculative settlement, um, but, but other shadow cities um, are by design largely empty of humans, not by accident, but on purpose. These are, as already mentioned, some the ghost cities that are populated by legions of mimetic personas crackling within nearby data centers as the surrounding hard shell landscape is largely unpopulated by physical human beings. Any such of these may be homes to hundreds of millions, billions of shadows, but only a few dozen workers. I think this ratio is a sign of things to come. It's a kind of post-human urbanism in practice, not in theory, but in um, uh, uh, but one that for which these I think these kinds of shadow cities will come to be a predominant urban form, um, even though their progress uh, went largely ignored in architectural schools. Um, for the first decade of this century when increasingly fantastic accommodations for human clients took precedent. This does not mean that shadow cities are actually virtual, however, to the contrary. Uh, the sprawling distribution of factories and ports, container sorting centers, freight airports, as well as the networks of thirsty data centers comprise a continuous, discontiguous meta city for objects. Um, to imagine it as numinous or cloud-like or immaterial is an expensive illusion. Now, there is there, there in that in the sense a there there. Um, it is not a, it is not an a, it is not a, a city that that disappears when you wave your hand at it. But and when you and I chat or post or have meetings like the one that we're having right exactly right now, um, sitting all sitting in different parts of the world. I'm in one place, you are in another, um, or we may even be in the same city at the same time, but the conventional conversational point of contact between my persona and yours is literally, is literally and physically located in the shadow city where neither of us live. Uh, for Zoom, it's in a distribution of AWS data centers that 
that produce this illusion of a of a common experience of, of of the of a common place in which uh, of this meeting to converse we draw <clears throat> upon those shadows and speak to one another through them as masks carving links between human zones and shadow cities we sew threads with one another in between places and in doing so contribute more texture to the model simulations that mediate those circuits sprawling and interlocking and incommensurate now lastly there's another kind of chinese shadow city um uh, perhaps worth speaking to and though that are populated by ghosts in fact um and on whose behalf the living burn joss paper simulated money uh, that ancestors will receive in the afterlife. A few years ago, there was uh, a major hyperinflation within this ghost currencies. $100,000 bills immediately became Zimbabwe scale denominations of million dollar bills and billion dollar bills, perhaps due to macroeconomic factors on the other side, perhaps due to other reasons. But shadow data Shadow city data centers operate, I think, on and actually on an analogous, if more secular principle. They're not only haunted, they are purpose built for ghosts that are we the living. Not only are not uh, we not only are house our own ghosts there, the ghosts that are us, we monetize them as a core currency of the model simulations that we inhabit and which inhabit us, making and burning money along the way as we go. I wanna then, before concluding, take a couple of detours then um, of the ways of thinking through the question of, of stimulation uh, beyond augmented reality. Uh, one having to do with the um, more geopolitical and one having to do at the invitation of, of the speaker series on artificial intelligence. So one of the issues that are, for reasons that are not obscure that political science and political philosophy in general is, is considering with due seriousness at the moment is in essence, what comes after neoliberalism? Um, a recognition that the post-Cold War moment is past, that we are in, in a post-post-Cold War era, but one that without a name. Um, I think in time, we will arrive at a name or a framework for this that includes within it an understanding of the central role of simulationism um, as a as 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 a mechanism for how uh, how the organization of power uh, and indeed uh, in so socioeconomic infrastructural systems uh, indeed work. By this, I mean things like um, I recall one of my when I began the Strelka program, spending a, the summer of 2016 um, in Moscow, which was if you are if you remember the summer that Pokemon Go became. Uh, a global phenomenon, um, and walking around the center of the city um, near the Kremlin uh, and, and around that you would see at almost any time of day, thousands and thousands of people catching uh, Pokemon uh, in Red Square, inside the Kremlin wall, outside the Kremlin, the rest of this as well. And this was back when Pokemon was run by Niantic, which was a Google, um, a Google company. And, and it was clear that the Kremlin saw this as a bit of an oblique message from Google that we can send a crowd your way anytime we like. Uh, that the role of, of a motivated simulation uh, as a social organizing principle was one that, um, that had been declared uh, fair game, if you like. Now, those of you who, like myself, who spend a fair bit of time in, in, in Russia are well aware of the role of, of what we might call ideological simulationism, of the production of the artificial production of narratively complete mythical semiotic universes, in many cases tied to nation or brand or ideology or some variant of monotheism. And in this, not just in Russia, but certainly many, but everywhere, uh, in the United States most certainly, the difference between government and the production of this closed semiotic world seems uh, uh, not so clear. Um, so perhaps it's because I've been spending a lot of time in Surkov's Russia, but I don't think that's quite it. Um, the old pop, the old saying that um, the GOP used to have a TV station uh, and now Fox has a political party, uh, it would, would speak to the same, the same condition. 
perhaps Xi's control of the Chinese ideoscape or Modi's in India or in the B, with the BJP or Planet Bernie uh, here in California, the rise of these echo chambers that based on conceptually complete simulations of an ordered universe um, based on gaming principles as much as mass media principles of simulation as political content is a phenomenon I think that is not only pervasive and central to the geopolitics in which we find itself um, and it's not going away. It is in many cases what political culture is now. There are also then, to make this argument for we are in a moment of simulationism, um, is the role of scientific simulation in the, a motive, in, in, the, in the way in which we conceptualize all other forms of, of, of politics, particularly perhaps a politics in relationship to ecologies and climate systems. There is then a different, a different kind of planetary politics based around, for example, the common frame of reference of climate change um, that seeks to give political priority and agency to large scale, long duration simulations of macrological processes such as climate. Now it doesn't articulate itself as such, um, but the core of this approach and this imaginary is an attempt to refocus government from a role in the mediation of voice in the democratic sense to the administration of, of, of ecologies, human or not, which is to make scientifically significant uh, statistically significant simulations of the future, what the climate would be like in 2050, into a kind of sovereign actors in the present to use scientific simulations of the future as the mechanism to legitimate governing decisions in the present. This is also a kind of simulationism. <clears throat> Thirdly, there is also, <clears throat> excuse me, there is also a kind of logistical simulationism, um, the seemingly more prosaic logistical governance of material, uh, material and object flows that constitute <clears throat> that constitute the material reality of economies. That which I, I show you a picture here of a <clears throat> software used to buy space on a in a container. These are based on a collaborative, but anyone who uses BIM software will know exactly what I mean on a daily basis. These are based on a collaborative multiplicity of special purpose simulations here of empty slots on contain cargo containers, price models, supply variants, taxation arbitrage, insurance and enterprise reinsurance, actuarial tables, predictive consumer demand models, high-speed trading, market models, and so on. These Morlock worlds of global capitalism are tied together through the messy overlapping of micro simulations and modelings, modelers counter modeling and counter modeling one another. This is in essence, not just what digital capitalism does, it's what it is. The official mode of institutional urbanism, that is what you know, colloquially smart cities might be seen as then the attempt to apply this principle to the administration of everyday life. So within these three, the ideological simulationism and scientific simulation and logistical simulationism, I think we have the basis of trying to understand in fact what, what, not, what not only what will come after neoliberalism, but what has come after neoliberalism. So I want to then speak before I conclude to a bit around AI and the role of doubling simulation digital twinning within AI. Um, through a term that I talk about in a different section of the, of the new book called the inverse uncanny valley. Um, the inverse uncanny valley is the phenomenon um, of seeing yourself from an outside alien perspective and being creeped out by your own image. We don't fully recognize ourselves. We appear strange and not as what we, not as what we imagine ourselves to be. These moments of, of demystif of, of this, such moments of demystifying confrontations are not only, I think, psychologically instructive, they are in a way politically crucial in terms of a sense of what what an eight and human is. The obvious examples of humanoid robotics, deep fakes, camouflage, chatbots, machine vision, so on are of central concern. But I think there are bigger stakes for a post-anthropocentric, post-anthropocenic design as well. That is, at what point does is what point does designing to accommodate the wants and needs of an illusory humanist self-image become catastrophic? That is, 
can the future can be based on a human artificial intelligence interaction design model so long as it is you know so, so long as it accommodates that 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 self image i think which is where i think most ai design is at this point a kind of congratulation of the illusion of the humanist self image rather than a condition by which you have a space of interaction between two unlike forms of intelligence now, so again, to so the questions of where then are those spaces for mutual recognition and misrecognition? All right, so what do we mean by inverse uncanny valley? Well, I assume we're more or less familiar, but the, the term uncanny valley comes from the Japanese roboticist Moshihiro Mori, who in the late 1960s and early 1970s in the design of prosthetics, um, came to identify a kind of likability score uh, in the mechanical humanness of that prosthetic. That is, if something, if the mechanical arm didn't really seem very, um, didn't really seem like, it looked more like a machine arm than a human arm, this was this this was not so bad. If it looked really, really a lot like uh, a, hu a, a human arm, for example, that was replacing, that was fine. But if it only looked kind of like uh, a human arm, this, the, 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 the recipients wanted it off the body as soon as possible. Um, this then has to do that. This then was, as you probably know, more and more extrapolated, not just to uh, uh, prosthetics, but also to things that look like uh, humans. Uh, and this is more now the more conventional uh, usage of the term. So industrial robots, maybe with little smiley faces on them, those are fine. Stuffed animals don't really look like tigers. That's fine. A healthy person, this is fine. But it's this sort of in, it's sort of almost human thing that really creeps us out. There is a, a kind of, of a, a kind of defeated attempt at recognizing oneself in the thing um, that reaches a level of discomfort. Now, there's something, again, I, I'm arguing sort of psychologically and philosophically instructive here. Now, there's lots of other ways in which the question of the reflection of the self in the machine intelligence might work out in, in different cultural forms. Uh, Kupchak's famous Rossum's Universal Robots from the 1920s presented the machine intelligence as this kind of, uh, uh, as this sort of, uh, you know, utilitarian automaton with which we are all sort of familiar. Um, there was also before us the kind of Kuri puppets centuries before, centuries before this, which were also a kind of mechanized, uh, mechanized uh, uh, homunculi. Uh, figures of, of human body and human interaction that would show, demonstrate this kind of process. It was a very different kind of aesthetic, uh, a very different kind of, of imaginary for what uh, the mechanism of, of what the performance of the, the, mechani the performance of a mechanization of human performance might look like and might be like. Um, it was also, in a way, then the kind of impetus that expired uh, Makoto Nishimura, who was the who was Japanese, the sort of father of Japanese robotics, who in the night who saw Rosum's play about the universal robot, was sort of horrified at this representation of robots in the in the play, and decided he was going to build um, provide a different angle, different direction for uh, robotics in Japan and, and his famous work, the Goku Tensoku, 1929, was this enormous lifelike uh, uh, robot figure made of no metal. Um, it was all uh, other kinds of the more uh, pleasing organic materials. And it was meant to represent not this, the kind of, um, the, the kind of brainless, mindless, a zombie-like robot of, of Rosam's play, but rather something that would demonstrate the highest and most noble uh, capacities of, 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 what, of what it meant to be alive. Now, there's much to say that I won't have time to get into about the, the, the ways in which Nishimura's work and others may form the foundation of a, a, a sort of idiosyncratic Japanese uh, robotics culture um, and why the certain forms of robotics that might be seen as uncanny and disturbing in other cultures are perfectly acceptable in, in a Japanese. This is, of course, um, uh, Paru, the robot baby seal, who is gen who's given to senior citizens with dementia who receive, who imagine they receive love from this robot, a kind of uh, massive attribution error, uh, emotional infill, um, and, and so forth. But there is the, it, here is another kind of economy of at recognition um, and based on a misattribution that we kind of see here as well. Um, we have all kinds of this much discussed, I'm not gonna go into this as well about killer robots, robot, robots actually then 
accidentally committing suicide, sex robots, and so forth. But part of the thing is around, I think, this inverse, the recognition error of the inverse on Canyon Valley has to do with, again, this kind of the, the, the a sense of replacement, uh, a sense of attribution uh, projection in relationship to this replacement and displacement. This is a uh, famous phantom limb uh, experiments in which people who, ex who, have, ex who have lost a limb will experience excruciating pain in the limb where it doesn't exist because of a kind of mismapping of the Mis, uh, mismapping of the body. Strangely enough, you give them a mirror where they their brain, their mind sees this limb replaced, and it causes this remapping of the body in relationship to relationship to uh, this this new reality. All of which to say is this this dynamic of self image and self modeling in relationship to its own reflections and externalizations, and how those doublings and twinnings and externalizations in essence speak back to us. Uh, has everything to do with what we're what we're speaking with here as well. Okay, so um, back to the inverse on Canny Valley uh, in, in a sense. One of the the things maybe we may want to critique, we, we may want to enter into you know some discussion a little bit about is this process by which, um, uh, with, particularly in the West, that the the question around AI is always posed as a kind of either or. Uh, you can think of the Turing test as a sort of, you know, the, the AI is either a human or it's not a human. Um, and the question of trying to, fi trying to figure out in practice which is which always gets extremely, um, always gets extremely complicated. Uh, now, I want to, I'm trying to speed up a little bit here. What we call then the inverse on Kenny Valley um, is the name for this process then by which you see yourself through the not not see yourself in a way sort of recognizing the robot and the machine intelligence and attempting to recognize it by projecting your own sense of self image upon it but it is the process by which you see yourself through its eyes seeing yourself from this alien perspective um, not only looking at something strange but instead seeing ourselves through its eyes not as we imagine ourselves to be and not as we recognize ourselves to be um, and what I want to suggest that is these moments of demystifying confrontations, that perhaps like Salar's shift from the manifest to latent image, um, uh, are not only psychologically the instruct instructive, they are crucial politically as well. So again, what Salar's called the latent manifest image, the most important based, you know, extrapolating from this, we might say that most of the most important scientific discoveries involve getting outside our own intuition with some technologically assisted alienation and extension. The technological alienation of the telescope, the mathematical alien plus mathematical abstraction, so forth, equals heliocentrism. It is, it is only through this process of alienation that we learn anything. Um, now, the question then, it, it, again, back to this, has to do with what extent do we design human AI interaction based on that manifest image or latent image, let's say, to what extent is it based on an accommodation of how it is humans imagine themselves to be? And to what point is it based on um, uh, modes of interaction with machine intelligence that actually in a way disclose us to ourselves by seeing ourselves through the eyes of that which we interact, um, which would I think inevitably bring with it a certain collapse of certain forms of illusion within that humanist self-image. Um, some of the most difficult parts of this are and will continue to be a kind of this attempt to, in you know, uncanny valley style way, to try to identify, is that thing I'm seeing human or not? Um, do I recognize myself in it or it in me? Uh, and watch this reaction. Is it human or not? Is it a simulation? Is it a double uh, or not? Is it real or not real? Here's your virtual, virtual uh, uh, newscaster. Uh, it's all, the thing is, it's always both. Um, and so basing the real on this homo, homo skeuomorphism, let's say, of making things seem more human than they really are, uh, ultimately will lead to, will lead to misery. Um, it also then, I think, this question of sort of thinking about AI primarily in relationship to is it human or is it not human, also leads to the kind of a misunderstanding of the infrastructures of AI itself. One, not only under, not only a misrecognition that what looks like an entirely computational process is, of course, has a lot of humans in the loop all the way along the way. 
but also the kind of genre of AI critique that holds that this is somehow a meaningful, a, a, a kind of sensational disclosure that they've, that like, aha, we've caught you. There actually are humans in the loop. Well, there always are humans in the loop and this is, this should be taken as the kind of point. Now, much to say about this, but I, I want to then just for sake of discussion, perhaps locate this back into the Turing test as a kind of foundational moment for this anthropomorphic miss this dynamic of anth the, uh, the demand for anthropomorphic recognition. Turing's test, of course, is based on this, an, uh, what he calls a sufficient condition, not a necessary condition, but it's still one in which the question of whether the machine intelligence will be recognized is based on whether or not it can be coaxed into performing how humans believe that, how humans think that humans think that the passing and performance of human-like thinking in reflection to the humanist self-image becomes a condition by which this machine intelligence is recognized. Clearly, I'm trying to argue for the opposite and inverse of this as well. Now, this question then of trying to differentiate the, 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 the real or the double, the simulation, or this which is sort of as which also can lead to various kinds of, I think we'll look back upon strange kinds of political maneuvers the few years ago, California legislature tried to pass a law that would require online bots or any other kind of bots to announce themselves as being bots so that you wouldn't be th fooled and be fooled into thinking you're talking to a human. Now, um, given the fact that of course many chatbots are, are both a mix of code and real life, real voice and real conversations, that they are always a, a mixture of human and the, the human and its double all the way down the stack, the ensuing explanations that these bots may provide to people about uh, may provide a bit more existent might end up being a bit more existential than anyone would really have in mind. Um, they may, in other words, point to more, uh, let's say, Philip K. Dick like questions about one's own status. Um, and as you see here, the more you have to answer this question, the less sure you become of the answer. So I think that in many ways, the urban scale implications of this will have everything to do with how we think in the near future of automation, what itself becomes to define how we how automation is understood as an essential part of city's work and so forth and so on. So let me conclude um, my remarks so we can get to the conversation with um, just a few questions, a few points, um, and back to augmented reality. Um, when the topic turns to AR, um, in my seminars of late, one of the, once we get through some of the questions about this process of subtitling and so forth, one of the questions that comes up quite often is, what will we call non-augmented reality? Uh, if AR becomes so pervasive, what, what will be the term that we use for the, um, for the, the, the pre-AR or the non-AR reality? And by this, again, I mean, not only the non-semiotically layered object, but also the sense of the world without preemptive interpretation. Some popular candidates in our discussions have been baseline reality, natural reality. Um, and I imagine in time, um, there will be nuanced and perhaps politicized schools of thought uh, and to the differences between those terminologies. 2000 years ago or so, Lucretius explained um, the relationship between what we see and what is out there to be seen as a matter of atomic dust particulates. The way he described it was that objects not only have shadows, but they also shed atoms, which float about in space and ultimately land in the eye of the perceiver, like spores, which allow the object to be seen. So for the Epicureans, natural vision is already a kind of externalized doubling, or perhaps a process built in the explosion of objects into pollinating micro simulations that are decoded by the receiver to represent the whole of the original. Today, the neocortex has made significant progress actually in understanding itself. And it presently understands itself as, as Jeff Hawkins will talk to you about next week, um, understands itself as a form of living matter that is constantly making predictive models of the world around it. What is seen is perceived in relationship to what, not just the brain, but lots of different three not but lots of different um cerebral cortexes predict will be out there analogous in some ways perhaps to how personal profiles 
frame the course of action in relationship to recursive prediction models of future objects. That is, our, our brains in producing thousands and thousands of different predictive models of the world around us. The world is producing perhaps an equal number of predictive models about us as we act within it. So what has been set in motion by planetary scale computation is among other things, an infrastructure of cognitive simulation. Its most important accomplishment to date, climate science and the deduction of climate change, um, and thus indirectly, the premise of the Anthropocene and its variants, is a project of building massive simulations. Future climatic conditions are generated in relationship to models made in the present day of Earth's past, which calibrate our confidence that our predictions are valid. The governing question opened up by digital doubling and simulation at this scale are vexed to the core. How can models of the future recursively govern the present such that the underlying planetary conditions that enable them to exist at all will not themselves collapse? It is this potential collapse of the model in the real that may haunt all the others floating about in the wind waiting to be seen. So with that, I thank you and look forward to our discussion. Thanks, Ben. That was that was that was extraordinary. It was so dense. I was scribbling notes out, and uh, I wasn't keeping pace with things. I mean, it's. I think there are a few choice sentences in there which were carefully, carefully put together and very, very powerful. And those are the kind of uh, ones I want to go back over this video and record precisely because I think there's some really interesting nuggets of thought there. Uh, the other comment, uh, general comment, I think was actually, I, I thought what you presented, I mean, I think it's got he, really relevant to architects, but rightly, and it somehow seems to be a kind of combination of some of the ideas from the stack and some of the ideas of, from the uh, uh, revenge of the, of, of, of the, of the real. So um, it's, uh, it, it has that, I think that's astonishing. Um, let me just, there's one thing that I found intriguing early on, and that was the question of the subtitle. Um, I mean, I, this is a concept I hadn't thought of before, and I think it's actually a very beautiful one. And I want to just put to you a kind of what, to my mind, is one of the real problems about um, the way that architects perceive architecture. And that is the sense that we tend to, the discourse is about the object, right? And when you compare that to, say, someone like sort of uh, Homi Baba or other people who see it, that basically it's about the object, but also the subjective way in which you understand the object, how it's inscribed with narr within narratives and so on, you get a different sense. It's kind of given meaning. That object is given meaning by that narrative. Um, uh, uh, Freddie Jameson says something kind of similar where he says that actually the meaning of work of art is allegorical. You've got to know what it's supposed to be or mean, otherwise it's inert. So you have this kind of, and this is an interesting model to me, to my mind. Um, and it almost, to my, it sounds a bit like your subtitle is not so dissimilar to that notion of the narrative. Now, what I find very interesting is this, the notion that, um, that human beings, what distinguishes human beings from AI is, of course, we have consciousness and so on, and we are kind of meaning-making machines. I mean, I think that's the kind of the important uh, uh, thing that we're always finding um, meaning in things whereas AI wouldn't. Um, and from that point of view, um, you could maybe compare uh, the kind of zombie notion that David Chalmers has about an AI without consciousness to what a building actually is. The building doesn't have any of that. It's, it, it, uh, from that point of view, the discourse of architecture, which to my mind is not building so much as the discourse in which those buildings are inscribed and giving meaning, that becomes the subtitle, and one could even argue that all of architecture is a subtitle because that's how we interpret and make sense of the built environment. Maybe I could just put that provocative comment to you, and, and maybe I mis misunderstood you, but uh... no, no, no. I think we're, we're, we're. I think there's a good thread to pull on here, um, and see see what we go with this. Um, I I think for uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah, we are humans and other animals. I mean, humans in particular are meaning making creatures. Um, I think there's probably much to be discovered and considered about what we mean by meaning um, exactly and what the word meaning really refers to and how different it is from pattern recognition um, and associative make ability to do a kind of an, uh, analogical pattern recognition process, which of course comes anytime you have pattern recognition, you also have apophenia of um, 
false positives, uh, you know, seeing faces in clouds is also a kind of meaning making uh, that is uh, that is not necessarily one that is always always helpful. I, I think that, and uh, I, I, I take your point about, I mean, the idea of thinking about the architecture, I mean, let's take the architecture question as you pose it with the narrativization as, as a similar to the face in the cloud problem, where you have, uh, you know, a grand cathedral or uh, a, a house or capital building or some, or, or whatever, some site that's supposed to be pregnant with significance. Um, to be sure, that meaning is not in the object itself. You can't crack open the building and find at the molecular level the, sub, the, the, the core substance of this meaningfulness in it. Um, it. It is massive. It's a hallucination. It's a projection. It's an organization of, of particular signs and symbols and, and, and you know, that get repeated over and over that come to constitute this, that come to constitute the building as a sufficient pattern in which some meaning would be subsequently recognized in whatever kind of motivate, motivated sense. Um, that could be a personal, private kind of meaning, or it could be a, you know, some, a, something that is, uh, that is announced in advance uh, by a, by a, institutionally about this meaning. Now, I think the difference what I'm, perhaps between the way in which we think of AR as subtitling and this kind of narrativization of reality um, is, is, is that one, is that for AR subtitling, in essence, this pattern recognition is automated um, and it is externalized in ways that are unique and perhaps not necessarily uh, always welcome. Um, that is, if what you were to encounter someone in the street and to sort of, and to see them, uh, you may decide, you know, you may try to size them up and to figure out who they are and what they're about and whether or not they're your friend or your enemy. But you have to do this interpretation. You have to sort of manage this pattern recognition in some sort of way as well. I think this is a very different situation than when reality comes pre-interpreted, where it is, it is, it is literally laminated with an interpretive pattern recognition framework such that at a perceptual and cognitive level, and Chalmers talks about this quite a lot in his new book on VR, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to differentiate. It becomes at, at a kind of, it becomes difficult to differentiate uh, on a habitual and at a kind of uh, tacit level um, to what extent the interpretation of the world around you is something that is programmed and something that is uh, naturally cognitive. And it's the mixture between the two um, that is both that is sort of the pharmacological in this pharmacon uh, quality of AR um, as both a mechanism for an extraordinary capacity for communicating from one person to communicate an interpretive framework to another person by showing you how I see the world on the one hand to a mechanism for the automation of cognitive fundamentalism on the other. Uh, and I, I think probably we're looking at futures that include both. Could could I? I mean, would it be safe? To, I'm just I'm just just thinking while you were talking. Though, would it be? I mean, what's interesting is you get you get this whole discussion about the ideology and architecture. But but almost it seems like you could say architecture is an ideology. That's exactly that sort of it's a way of thinking. Is that is that fair or is that um, thinking? About architecture is architecture is a way of thinking. Or, well. I suppose it means, I, I, I suppose, I think there would be ways of defining architecture that I think would, that would be fair to say, um, at least as a sort of way of thinking. Uh, certainly, you know, we have part of the reason, you know, our program at Strelka uh, is ostensibly an architecture program, but we, you know, we have half of our, own, you know, half of our cohort are architects, but we haven't done any building projects in five years. Um, but we take the, the kind of the 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 kind of um, the 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 way in which architecture brings in lots of sources to try and kind of processes them and tries to, and then translates them into something propositional, a kind of diagrammatic intelligence, a kind of link between uh, formal and semantic intelligence, and this I, and that is I think that there are methodologies and skills and ways of thinking that are intrinsic to the architecture studio that can be applied to things other than buildings. But if you meant that the building, the built environment itself is a 
as you say, is a kind of ideological framework. I, I guess no. I would be curious as to what you mean by that. No, 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 no I mean, no, I think that the, the, the architecture becomes the lens through which we look at the built environment. The built environment is the object and- it's Oh yeah. The, the, yeah. yeah. So I think the key idea there has to do with artificiality. That I think the art that that art that the architecture sort of is a practice by putting one brick on top of another, not sort of you know measuring the bricks that exist necessarily, and that it's the idea that the built environment is there. It's not only the built environment has been constructed artificially, but that it is to be constructed artificially. That this is that this is that this is a kind of fundamental. That this is an ongoing and fundamental process, um, and I don't mean artificial in any derogatory sense. I mean it really in the you know, you could say in a scientific sense of, of there is uh, an, a statistically significant anomalous regularity within a system um, that by which we could detect artificiality uh, within it. So I, I think in that, I, I would sort of ground it there that architecture is a way of thinking the built environment as an artificial construct, um, which, and then everything in that environment, including intelligence, perception, all the things we've been talking about today would be available to artificialization as well. Um, and then would be, and then in the case of architecture would also be understood as part of the built environment. And I think for me, that's, that's an, that's a way of thinking about what AI is that I'm quite attracted to instead of thinking of AI as a kind of brain in a Petri dish or a metaphysical digital philosopher from nowhere, Instead of understanding it as more like a landscape scale phenomenon in which you have a multitude of little kinds of sensing and thinking species uh, modeling the world and interacting with us, us in the world and with each other in a, in a cacophonous storm uh, of, of ways is more likely, I think is the better way of thinking about how AI is as a, as a kind of sensing and cognitive apparatus rather than a kind of singularization <clears throat> of it as a artificial person. And so this idea of AI as landscape versus AI as person, I think I, I, I would say is part of the way architect is part of the way architecture sh does and should see AI, which is as part of the built environment, which is to say as something to be artificialized. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with that. Um, uh, I'm left thinking that, in fact, well, of course, that I means that the whole of it, the, the discourse that goes on in a place like Saga or any school of architecture is a cold form of simulation because you're not really talking about the build as such, you're imagining a possible building project. So there are any number of different sort of layers of, 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 that, that, that go through that. Now, I, I, think, I think that's, that's that isn't, isn't that all? I mean, all architecture school in many respects are all about. I mean, I think one of the good things about architecture is this is, I mean, I mean, the way we study, teach architectural history, it's always half the projects that are taught never were built. Um, it's, it's this practice of, of, it's a projective and speculative and normative practice. Like this is in fact what should go here. And I think that's also part of its strength. Obviously, SciArc has a preoccupation with the object per se. Um, but, and I think that's probably what qualifies it as, but I, I, I think that the speculative the, spe the speculative project isn't unique. Yeah, I, th I think that the question of, I mean, object or ontology and all those things is, is, is an interesting kind of one. I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, because uh, behind all this there seemed to be the figure of Yukui, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong here, the digital <coughs> object. And I wonder where you position yourself on that. I mean, I have, I have a little difficulty with his perception of that, because as soon as you, you know, bump into a physical wall wearing your AR glasses, you know that that object is just a simulated object anyway. But how would you? How do you perceive Yukui's work in relation to Yuk and cosmotechnics? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question to ask. I, one of the other things I'm writing presently is a um, the Het Neue Institute, the Dutch National Design Institute, is had a lecture, had a conference series, and is publishing a book called Vertical Atlas later this year, which was where in which they invited several couple dozen people to contribute to a kind of mapping of the stack globally as it exists throughout the world. And so, you know, Africa and India and Russia and South America and, um, and everywhere. Um, and the project was explicitly formulated as a kind of inspired by the stack and thinking through how to map the stack, but also through Yuke's idea of cosmotechnics. Um, and these are the two kind of guiding frameworks for the book. And so, my contribution to the book is to kind of consider the relationship between the stack thesis and cosmotechnics more generally um, and the way in which they may illuminate or obscure 
uh, different things about themselves. Um, it's a complicated question. And I, I mean, I'll, I'll assume generally your audience is familiar roughly with Yuke's work, but in general, the Cosmotechnics thesis is that instead of thinking of technology as an anthropological universal, um, he argues that, that what a technology is and how it operates is in fact uh, culturally grounded and, and, fit and, and determined to a great larger extent, <clears throat> which I think is it's both its strength and its weakness. I think the weaknesses of it, I mean, Yuke is also much more of a Heideggerian uh, and, and I basically loathe Heidegger. Uh, and, so, uh, uh, and so there's a, just a general point of different starting points um, uh, in, 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 this, in this regard. <clears throat> I also think that there's a tendency towards a strong cultural determinism uh, in, in Yuke's work where, I mean, he, he will take pains to differentiate his approach from, let's say, the ontological turn in anthropology, which is really is a kind of like absolute idealist real relativism. Um, but at the same time, there is a kind of, I, I, as I say, a kind of cultural determinism at work. That is, cultures are essentially a, a sovereign processes that themselves will structure technologies in such a way. That is, there's is the, the, the lack of emphasis on the ways in which, let's say, even though Yuke was a Stiegler student, I think there's ways in which Stiegler's work points to the ways in which cultures are, co are, are constituted by their technical relations and even evolution of human cognition is constituted by its technical relations that Yuke is well aware of, but uh, the ways in which cosmotechnics gets circulated in, in grad student culture, um, all of this becomes completely erased and it becomes reduced to a kind of uh, cultural essentialism, cultural determinism, uh, and 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 in way, in ways that actually rebind it back to Heidegger in ways that I, I don't think that I think are probably unfortunate. Now, um, to your question about the relationship then between any of this and the cosmotechnics, I, the way I would put it, uh, and, and and maybe we're sort of skipping ahead a little bit here, is is I do think the question of cosmology is extraordinarily important, but. And it, and, it, and it goes to the ways in which in the book, I'll be treating the, this question of planetarity. The argument is that we have two projects around planetarity presently at the moment. One is the philosophical project, which we might associate with Spivak and Chakravarti and Akhil Mbembe, which is a reconceptualization of, our, our, of the co-inhabitation of a limited planetary perch um, in, in a, in a post-global condition by which the, we need to, we've moved, we've moved beyond a kind of socio-deterministic and cultural deterministic view of history into one in which ecological processes and so forth are understood as being co-constituent of that history. Um, and one in which that is interested in, um, different kinds of arra di arrangements of capital and resources than those inherited from the colonial era on the one hand. And we have an astronomic planetarity that is in the same period of time over 20, 30, 40 years through climate science, um, through astronomic imaging and, and so forth that at, at a scientific cosmological level, we know much more about how our planet works, how the solar system works, how the universe works than we did even just one generation ago, the existence of exoplanets, the conceptualization of climate change uh, uh, you know, all, all, not to mention the the sort of verification that in, for all practical purposes, we are alone in the universe. The Fermi paradox is, you know, in this kind of regard, which is philosophically as significant, to, I think, as if we had discovered alien life. Long story short, we need a stereoscopic resolution between these two modes of, of planetarity, between the philosophical project that now needs to be based on the astronomic reality of our planetary condition, and, and, and a role for the humanities and philosophy in organizing and producing and generating and composing a new cultural cosmology that is in fact based upon that astronomic reality. Um, that the two need to be conjoined in a way uh, that might be similar to the way in which after the Copernican revolution, we had Kant. This was an attempt to, I think Kant got Copernicus backwards, but at least it was an attempt to update philosophy in relationship to the in relationship to the new shit that's come to light about how the universe works. I think we we desperately need that kind of cosmotechnics now. The kind of cosmotechnics we need is one to be composed. It's one that'd be artificial. 
It is one that is in front of us, and it's not one that will arrive through a patchwork of reified cultural traditions and and unrestrained perspectivalism. It's going to be something that is actually grounded upon the 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 cold astronomic reality of where and when we actually really are. Can, can I just take you up a little further on, on uh, well, the SIAC condition is, I think it's a fascinating condition right now, because on the one hand, you've got people like Graham Harmon, who come out of a Heideggerian tradition initially, well, his PhD was on Heidegger and tools. And uh, I also a little suspicious of Heidegger. I published a book once, Forget Heidegger, so I'm well, more than a little suspicious. But then we've got the kind of, I, and I think it's some extraordinary work coming out um, uh, that is more in the realm of, I mean, the kind of work, the simulated work that, uh, let's say, Damian Yovanovitch and, and Casey Ream, to, to, to a certain extent, are doing. And it seems to me, I'm just wondering whether you, I mean, even though they seem to be counterposed, like one is about the object and one is about, you know, an, another, an alternative, a simulation. It seems like there is a kind of there is a kind of a, a parallel between the, them, and in a sense, it's it's not the object so much as the appearance of the object, and it's the, the, the it's the realm of the appearances that's going on in the in the kind of the the work that Damien and others are doing. Can you see that co connection, or is that you know? You mean, and you're asking me to speak specifically to Syark as a as, yes, as the, yes. the intellectual environment of Syark. Is that the question? Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think that's probably. I think in 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 the war between phenomenon and, and between the you know, phenomenon and noumena. Uh, I think it's sire that phenomena has the upper hand for sure. Um, it's not really a pro it's not really a program about the you know the noumenal reality of the of, of the object itself. But I don't think Graham's work is really about the noumenal reality of the object either. I think it is. I mean, I have to say, you know, I, I've been in, I've taught at Syrac since year two, since two thousand one. I love the place. It's just like a second home in many ways. You know, it was a you know foundational point for my my career, intellectual development. And so I'm extremely fond of the place. Um, I have a lot of friends there. Um, I, I would say that that I, re, I my own positions are pretty far apart from those of Graham and let's say Tim Morton, who also teaches there um, as well. Um, and probably to a certain extent, there is, it, it, it would might go around this phenomenon, noumenon kind of dynamic that is, you know, that there is an allegiance to the mind independent reality and a, a, a kind of, call it post-enlightenment belief if you like, but or neo-rationalist belief if you like, that the models of the world that we construct should be, at a cultural level, should be based upon the scientific models of the world that we are actually able to deduce, that, that orienting, our, orienting our orientation to an, under, to an understanding of the mind-independent reality is not only tactically good i think it's the base ultimately the basis of what we might call ethics um <clears throat> i think you know graham takes the object as as essentially you know in, from a very different kind of place tim has a a kind of allegiance a, 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 an a, a symmetrical but inverted allegiance to irrationalism um and so that we we depart in this kind of regard now no so casey ram is someone who i've I've collaborated with quite a lot at, at SciArc more recently. We, we did a project with Google AMI on machine vision in the city together, which was based on actually kind of a lot of this AI and landscape discussion that we just had, which was based on the idea that the ways in which machine vision in the city tends to be thought of is either in the kind of Kaichi Matsuda sense of seeing, we see the city through the lens of machine vision, <clears throat> or the panopticon story where this, the machine vision is watching us individually as we stroll around the city. But if we hypothesize that the real, that the, the dynamic for the future of machine vision in the city is probably much more about things in the city looking at each, each, looking at each other, looking at themselves without the human as the primary protagonist of the story <clears throat> in one way or another, that you're likely to see a very different kind of technical evolution of the surfaces of the city um, in relationship to those kinds of camouflage display evolution dynamics. And so the project that Casey worked on was in essence what that city would kind of look like. Um, and so in this case, it was about appearances for sure, but it was about the technology of appearance itself and the ways in which the real world presents itself through this framework of appearance and decoy and camouflage and display um, as a as a real phenomenon, which again I you know I will would su suggest is kind of a different approach. 
Um, you know, Liam's work, Liam Young is also a dear friend of mine, someone who's been at Strelka and we've done, we've done lots of events together around this as well, but you know, his, he is, he's also a, um, you know, he's, he's really as much a science fiction filmmaker as an architect. And so the role of the narrative in architecture is obviously much stronger that you were speaking to before is extremely strong in, in, uh, in the way in which he would approach this. But to your point, the kinds of cities that, that Liam produces, Liam describes the planet city, things like this is much more about what the city looks like and feels like, and would be like, um, as a, uh, as, a, as an, as a, as, as an experiential environment, than it is about worrying about, you know, the plumbing, uh, and, and, and um, how it gets there and, and any of this other kind of more mundane behind the scenes thing. Even, in, and you know, again, I love Liam's work, but you know, even the way in which he deals with the sort of behind the scenes infrastructural issues, um, you know, the inhuman cities and post-human infrastructural cities, his primary interest is in them as, as a kind of extraordinary um, aesthetic reality. Um, and to and to and to divert in a way to and this is where he's kind of an odd fish within Sciarc to divert attention away from the aesthetics of the extant object as metaphysical form into the already existing aesthetics that are produced by this hyperfunctional logistical imaginary. Um, and I think that's something. And, and I think this is where his you know the, a lot of the value in his work is is to understand these logistical architectures, you know, so-called industrial architecture as themselves, not only the fundamental infrastructure of the world, uh, but also the, the avant-garde of, of, of architectural aesthetics as well. It's not Patrick. Patrick is, Patrick is you know, decades behind. Um. I, so I, we've got some questions coming in, and I want to ask uh, Matt Gorby in a second. But I, I, hope that, I, hope that was a, I hope that was a sufficient answer. I, I tried to answer yeah, no, your question. No, about, no. Sorry, yeah. yeah, no, it is. I mean, I think it's a complex landscape, but it, but it's great to get some insight. I want to ask you, I want to say a personal question, but what is, I think is interesting about architectural culture is that we have like, you know, there's two groups that we refer to. I mean, I was always brought up in when I studied at Cambridge, there was always a some philosopher that you would adhere to. And, and I was taught Gadamer and Heidegger and God knows yeah. what else. But then meanwhile, the chair of architecture, Sandy Wilson, had Wittgenstein. You know, have philosopher, will theorize became the kind of logic of how we would operate. But that, so there has always been outside there. And I'm rethinking architecture is about that. How can we learn yeah. from Derrida and Deleuze and so on? But there's also another group actually inhabiting a, an architectural space of, of those not trained in architecture per se, figures like yourself and Sanford, um, Anna Graham Harmon, I guess, also, and, and Mark, the late great Mark Cousins, and there, there, uh, there, there, and Mamel de Lander and so on, are these kind of critical kind of. Um, commentators and I, I can't help but see that discussion of the kind of uh, this uh, this kind of criticality that is brought to bear on the creativity of the architectural education has been a bit like a gang you know you've got these two networks one is being trained by the other and you know architects get a certain criticality coming out of this you know really powerful uh, uh, discourse you know uh, now it but then the opposite must happen in some sense and that is other words in other words those uh, figures from the domain of philosophy or whatever you might call it you know are also being exposed to this kind of creativity coming out of the of the architectural discourse and i just want right. to to what extent that experience of working at Strelka and Sayak has really uh, kind of helped or, or or in a sort of creative way your outlook on life yeah, no, it's a wonderful question, and I think we're, uh, I think our our maybe in which we think about this are pretty similar. Um, I think that there's, you know, way, the way I see it maybe is is and you described it a little bit as here as well. There's there's one kind of relationship of theory to architecture is as you say, we'll make buildings that look like Deleuze buildings, we'll make buildings that look like Derrida buildings. Now we make buildings that look like Graham Harmon buildings. Um, you know, and and one of the nice things about this is it's always based on a kind of opportunistic misinterpretation. Um, in other words, like I like a lot of the buildings that are, I, in many ways, I like a lot of the buildings based on Graham's work more than I appreciate Graham's work. And, and when I talk to the architects who, who will talk about the role of Graham's work and the motivation for this building, it's clear to me that they don't really understand Graham's work, but that's good. That's fine. Like I'd much rather have that than some kind of 
true, you know, uh, true belief. So there's a creative misinterpretation that work that I think is actually quite productive. Um, now, I think there's another, as the way I would put it, I think as opposed to the making buildings that look like philosophy um, is the other direction, I think, as you put it, which is that there's philosophy to be generated from architectural questions. Philosophy generated from that, that philosophy in a speculative and projective mode that is parallel to the speculative and projective mode of architecture that I've described, philosophy that is diagrammatic. In many cases, that you know, the way in which architecture as a kind of synthetic and projective way of thinking through a complex storm of different variables, um, the role of philosophy in having a similar kind of methodology, and again, again to produce new theory to produce new philosophy, not to apply the philosophy to the problem, but to generate philosophy from the problem. That I think is kind of in a way where, you know, maybe the role of people like, I mean, I'd be very happy to put in a, on a group with Manuel and Sanford and, and, and the rest of this as a sort of thinking more of like the generation of theory from the architectural problematic rather than the projection of philosophy onto the architectural problematic. And I think that, we, and that the third one here would be the architectural, straight up architectural theorists, historians, which are, um, you know, in more of the Michael Hayes, Sylvia Lavin, uh, Eisenminian kind of mode of thinking about the history of architectural thought as a autonomous vein of thinking, which obviously there's quite a lot of value there. But I, I think it would be right to say that the project that I'm engaged with is, is not that um, necessarily. So I guess I'll put it as, I mean, this is why I think it's wonderful that you have, uh, you know, in an architectural lecture series, you've got myself and neuroscientists and people like Blaze who are brought into the question, not only because they can inform architects, but because architecture informs them. Um, and from the way the thing, I mean, Blaze is someone I'm currently collaborating with on a, you know, we've been working on issues around NLP for some time. Um, and, you know, and in this more speculative mode, he's been part of the stroke of program for some time. Um, and, and so it, it, this is another way in which architecture as a forum um, for thinking about the art, producing the artificial built environment more generally allows for a kind of synthesis of different, pers different perspectives. And I, I think this, this, remains, this remains quite important. I, I, might, I sense there was another aspect of your question that I'm forgetting. So yeah, no, I, I, no, just, I would just say, I think it's less, I mean, of course there is these, these, uh, uh, Harold Bloom, I think it was, created this understanding of these kind of ways in which people interpret the building or use Deleuze to produce buildings. But there's another more abstract level. I, mean, I remember Anne Balsamo once noticing architects. She said that, that with the architects are a bit like magpies. They're looking for little gleaming bits of, of silver, you know, glittering and, and, and absorbing them. And, you know, I've seen architects just feeding off this kind of uh, intellectual sort of stimulation that's coming out without any direct... Um, direct uh, application you know it's it's just that we kind sure. of we love it you know and i i've seen you know, andrew benjamin giving lectures at the aa and people sitting there and with a notepad not being able to take any notes but just in in a kind of rapture or simulation of that that that's coming from that that that's really yeah. what i'm thinking of yeah and i think that's that uh i think you know i think this is good i mean i think in some ways that's uh you know when i oftentimes you know when i will go to a conference on information theory or on scientific simulation or on astronomic imaging. Like I understand maybe a third of what everybody's talking about, but I, but I, I just, you know, I enjoyed trying to drink from the fire hose and catching what I can. Uh, and I, I, I think that's a good way of approaching this of like trying to be as omnivorous as possible and to find and allow for kinds of pattern recognition and that kind of associative modeling, because there'll be something from that discussion of the history of, Break, you know, of information theory that you might apply to your understanding of astronomy imaging that ends up, you know, re, re, reformulating the way in which you actually deal, you might frame and understand a more practical problem in front of you that seemingly has nothing to do with it. Um, but your own transfer learning methods have allowed for a different perspective on this as well. And so I, I, I agree. I, I, mean, I think this is also part of the, the, the ways in which this works. Um, I, I think that there's you know, art schools sometimes have a similar relationship of this as well. Um, though I, I think that there's maybe a different kind of approach here as well. Like art schools, art practices always tend to be highly individuated. 
they tend to be increasingly, at least especially in the American context, increasingly about the the practice itself is about the performance and projection, and projection and establishment of the identity of the artist themselves, uh, and that the cultivation of the practice is the cultivation of this, the positionality of this identity, uh, and that, I mean that in all you know in all sense in all senses of that. There's another way in which I think we all probably can think of lots of examples of this as well, where architects will not just be magpies, but will also, in essence, uh, wear bits of theory and ideas, almost like um, badges, uh, where you'll go to a lecture and you'll hear someone sort of talk a little bit. There'll be like a weird mixture, like this very odd mixture of Tim Morton and Franz Fanon and Manuel Delanda and Judith Butler and Kimberly Crenshaw. And you're like trying to imagine these five people in the same room together, but they'll kind of just spit out a bunch of a bunch of sentences that they've learned about this. And it's it's almost a kind of preamble incantation that basically says, like, what I'm doing is serious, or you know, like I I I've some, you know, like there's a position, this is this is kind of well, and then they'll present work that has fuck all to do with anything that they've said beforehand um that it's super maybe super interesting by itself and like if they actually had the confidence to extrapolate a theory from their own ideas rather than wrap themselves in this kind of uh masks uh borrowed masks uh we'd probably be better off i i see that phenomenon more in art schools and architecture schools but i think we see it in architecture schools as well no, I completely. That's very amusing. I, I completely agree with that. Uh, Matt Gorbay, Matt, would you like to ask your question? Matt is a, a graduate MIT Media Lab, currently a Doctor of Design student. Matt. Hi, Hi Matt. Um, thanks. Uh, we, we were, you guys were talking earlier about, you know, you said we are meaning making machines, Neil, and, uh, and the response was about just going back to this augmentation thing about walking down the street and you you're you're walking down the street and you're seeing people and you're making judgments or decisions about them and and you were talking about how that would be problematic when it gets sort of externalizing you have a machine doing it for you or in, in my understanding of what you were saying and uh and i and i guess i get just wanted to ask the question like isn't that in a way sort of a thing we do already in that we have all the inputs that make us who we are and we may think of this as sort of the natural pattern matching that we're going to be doing, but it's coming from a, a lifetime of, of what we've learned, what we've been seeing, what we've been exposed to, our religions or whatever else. And sure. now we're just simply in, in some way externalizing that. And obviously it's really different in a lot of ways, but I'm interested in what you think of uh, as those other ways, especially because you said, um, you know, you, you had this quote that I wrote down, it's through the process of alienation that we learn anything. You were talking about the telescope teaching us about heliocentrism. So yeah. in this case, does externalizing this idea that we're simply making matches based on some algorithm that has been has been offered to us in this moment, um, does it in any way just maybe actually help us develop a, a better understanding of how how we are as humans? And is that possibly like a good thing? Um, yeah, it's it's you know. I, I, I the way I, I thanks for the question. So I, the way I characterize it was as uh, the sort of reference I made at the end was to as this is a, this is the pharmacological quality of this, the pharmacons, which is which is fancy way of saying this. This is both remedy and poison at the same time. Like that, the, the capacity to do this is. It's not that it could be good or could be bad one way or the other. It's, it will inevitably be both um, at at, in, in, at the same time. And I think we need to approach it as such. Um, and but there are also we're early in the history of these technologies and what becomes the common sense and what becomes the basis by which these become everyday platforms uh, could go in a lot of different directions. Some of which would, some of which could be quite dark and some of which could be more along the lines of the epistemological technology function that you describe. My, the, this, every, everything I write, there's a kind of advocacy for answering this question of what planetary scale computation is for, that it ultimately it, it is a, its function, its teleology, even if you like, is as an epistemological technology, which is one that we predicated upon a kind of calibrated technical alienation such that our understanding of the, of the world would be disclosed to us in some way. And the key example of this is the idea of climate change itself. 
that without the, this massive planetary sensing and modeling and stimulation apparatuses, the whole concept of, of climate change wouldn't have, we wouldn't, know, wouldn't have the ability to spit out a hockey stick graph. And the concept of climate change, and thus indirectly of Anthropocene and Anthropocene theory, and that this would be impossible. Um, that's what I mean. Those are the modes of planetary scale computation we need to be pushing for. I, I'm not, you know, I think the fact that we built that on the back of global advertising platforms seems unfortunate to say the least. Uh, and and I, I think that the that it comes with other kinds of that may lead in some of these darker scenarios. And so you I don't I think it's easy to see a world in which it's easier to, for me to see a world in which the Abrahamic monotheisms dive into AR and pre-interpret the world for their adherence in relationship to friend and enemy. And this is what I'm concerned about. Um, you can also imagine one in which that there are, you know, fundamentals, that there's things about the world around us. It's molecular construction, it's carbon footprint, it's how you say that thing in Arabic. Uh, what the, you know, how, how that object has appeared in poetry in different kinds of locations that may allow us to not just externalize our categorical, one's own categorical thinking and, or externalize one ideology's categorical thinking, but would allow us to see the world through a plurality of those, the plura plurality of, uh, a plurality of those interpretive frameworks uh, simultaneously. Uh, in such a way that uh, we would have we would have access to how we each other think and how we each other see that could be that would automate communication in the significant sense of communication, not just information exchange, um, in ways that could be quite positive. And so, you know, it's going to probably be both. Maybe that makes it easier for us to understand why we already think the way we think or, or what, you know, some of the things. Yeah, and also, I mean, I completely agree with you. I'm not, I'm not at all suggesting that somehow our interpretation that, that, you know, that, that our, we always, obviously language thinks us more than we think through language. We, you know, we, we, our whole process, you know, our ability to think the world at all is already constructed by this externalized systems through which that conjugate us in one way or another. But I do think there's a difference between, there's a difference between you know, reading a sacred text, let's say, and trying to interpret it as a guide to how one should approach the world, and then is confronted with a scenario. And then you have to do the work to think about how right. to apply the principles to the scenario and abstract the principle, the, the, the abstract it into something real from being confronted with a situation and given a script that all you need to do is it's execute. Bit, I think there's a fundamental- end up a bit cultish. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Could be, it could be, yeah. I mean, I think I think we'll see aspects of, I, I think aspects of that seem to be probably inevitable, unfortunately, but that doesn't mean it's the only thing that will happen or should happen for sure. Thanks. So we have a couple of more questions. We got one from Minich uh, who was in the Zoom chat and one on the YouTube chat. If anyone else outside wants to send some message, uh, questions in, please go ahead. Um, so Mirich, would you like to, Mirich, I should say, is a bit like us. She hasn't been, managed to get to Shanghai. She's actually a, a student at Tongji on the Digital Futures program, but she's now in, still in Serbia, stuck in Serbia. Mirich, would you like to uh, ask your question? Um, yes, thank you. Um, so I was wondering, um, this is actually from your TED talk. It's the very beginning of it. And uh, I sort of got, uh, hung up on how you phrased it and um okay. I would, i'd like to know if you could talk further about uh, the mechanisms through which the present becomes the future which sounds kind of evident but uh how does the critique of the present in the format of the future actually influences the formation of such ideas within the development of the future so, uh no i'm not I'm interested how does ideas about the present structure the way we think about the future I'm sure I didn't quite get what you uh, no. How does it appear in the structuring of the future? Because when we represent the future sure. within the present as a critique of the present, right. then those ideas later influence the formation of such a future that was right. critiqued as an, as an amplified present. So how, right. how does that happen? What are the... Um, well, I mean, I, I think 
it does so because it influences the present. I mean, I, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a the question of the future and the, con the construction of the future um, as a way of organizing a sense of the present is probably a, in many ways a kind of primordial process. But I mean, the history of, the history of eschatology, let's say, of, of theories of the end of the world um, is one that exists through all major religions and sort of cultures in one way or another. And, and I, I think there's probably part of the construction of a cosmology. I mean, I'm gonna take a big picture approach to answering your question to start with. The construction of a cosmology usually includes uh, answers to the question of where we are and when we are. Where we are refers, you know, like how the earth is formed and where we are in relationship to the subterranean or the heavens. When we are refers to how it all began what caused all of this and eschatology refers to how it's all going to come to an end. Eschatologies tend to be teleological in this, in the sense to which think of like book of revelations that we, we know how the story is going to end. What we need, all we need to do is figure out where we are on the timeline. Um, but it's all kind of, it's deterministic. It's, 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 it's a deterministic story, uh, re religious eschatologies. It's everything's already sort of figured out. Um, and even in secular futurism from the, you know, Hegel and Marx kind of secular futurism um, and into the modern era of the turn of the last century, the future was still in many ways understood in a deterministic kind of sense that if we could calibrate our understanding of the present just so, that we could determine the inexorable, inevitable outcome within the future. Uh, and then organize the present in relationship to that. Yeah, and this is a kind of secularization of of, an, of the deterministic logic of eschatology. Now, I think the kind of futures that we work with today are very different in that they're essentially non-deterministic. That you, if you look at the IPCC scenarios for 2050 or 2100, there's a wide range of possibilities of where, where things are going to land. And the wide range of possibilities is not based on statistical uncertainty about the forcing effects of greenhouse gases on the environment. The uncertainty is what are the humans gonna do about it? Um, and so it's understood that the condition of the future is not something that is foretold, not something that is set up, but rather something that is continuously in the process of being created of being composed, which, which then again, it, it is an artificial construction in the same way in which that we were talking about this a bit earlier. And I think that shift from a non, from a deterministic to a non-deterministic future is kind of the important point uh, at this, at this one as well. But it's, I think it's also interesting to say is that there's a certain extent in terms of the role of computation in this, particularly in relationship to the climate science, it's also shifted kind of the role and direction and, and positions of futurity and past and relationship to each other in interesting ways. That is the way in which we determine those climate futures, calculate the climate futures is in relationship to climate pasts. That is, you would gather all of the data points about CO2 in the atmosphere, other kinds of things of what have happened through ice core sampling, tree ring sampling, so, so forth. Um, to figure out what the climate was like in 1700 or in 1500 or in 1400 AD. And then you produce, you generate a model that tries to, in essence, predict the climate in the past. Like you, you figure out the model to like, okay, if you have this much greenhouse gases, what would the climate be like? And then you apply this formula to try to predict what the year of 1700 would have been like, but you know what it was like. And so you can test whether your model works or not. And then you, then you have some confidence of applying the same model to the future to know what 2050 or 2100 would be like, that you, can, you feel confident in predicting the future because you have used the same formula to predict the past. This is another kind of odd and fascinating recursivity between the past and the future that uh, I think is worth exploring further. My last point was saying, and then I'll ask you if I've answered your question properly, is Part of, I think, the governing challenge of this moment is to, as I say, to think about ways in which we can act, we can ask the future to govern the present more directly, that our models of what 2050 would be like or 2100 would be like 
the activation of these models as non-deterministic um, is part of the act in, in terms of dealing with a non-deterministic future um, is is in, is intrinsic. Part is the, to, to gather them and to calibrate um, that uh, what the uh, 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 how our actions will will play out in relationship to that non-deterministic future um, requires a modeling of the future as a kind of orientation device uh, that is one that I think will be enormously important. And I think that's a different, probably a different relationship to the future than the kind of capital F futurism of of the 20th century in which the future was projected, you know, think of year 2000, you know, the year, future was something to be achieved. If we could just, you know, we could do, we can have flying cars and holograms and so forth. I think now we're thinking of the future more as something to be prevented. That the future that we are likely to have is one we want to prevent from happening. And I think a relationship to a future you want to prevent is very different than the relationship to a future that you want to achieve. Thank you. That is very uh, thought provoking. I have a lot to think about. Thank you. And so hello yes. to Belgrade. Hello to Belgrade. I was actually there last year with Strelka. We ended up in, in Belgrade. Uh, we couldn't get everybody into Moscow, so we ended up in Istanbul and Yerevan and Belgrade at the end. So hello, Belgrade. <laughs> we have a question from um, Marie Davidova from the uh, UK. YouTube chat. Um, her question is, thank you so much for the talk. Would you consider other than human species in this discussion? Which, uh, of course, in which, which discussion exactly? This well, I, it was before, her question came before the last question, so. Uh... Well, I know, I wonder if, if, if I asked you to be, clarify which discussion exactly so I can make my sure, make sure I'm answering the question you are asking rather than the one I imagine you're asking. I, I, well, she's not on, she's on the YouTube uh, uh, live oh. stream, so we'll get any quick, quick answer. Well, sure. I mean, I, I think that, you know, the boundary between human and non-human is obviously pretty, um, is, is obviously pretty porous. Uh, you know, the, the boundary of species is, 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 is a gradient at, 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 at best. Um, I think, I think that one of the, you know, one of the, the 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 impacts around the discussions around AI is that it will it focuses less around. I mean, it's an idea that goes back to not just to Turing but to Leibniz and the rest of this. That, that the discussion of the artificialization of intelligence is ultimately a way that intelligence reflects upon itself and understands itself what it is through its own artificialization. Um, hopefully, it does so in ways that are not just replicating its own self illusions, but I think one of the other things that th that that approach to discussion around AI as one that is about the process of of conceptualizing intelligence on its own part, and of course the begin the rise of cognitive science in the mid twentieth century grew entirely out of that exact dynamic, and later in neurophilosophy with the church lens and so forth and so on, um, would be inclusive of of understanding that intelligence is not a binary on or off switch, but is a spectrum and exists in lots of different forms. That there are, I mean, I think there are lo logical arguments to be made about what a general intelligence might be, that there are forms of intelligence, capacities for induction and deduction and mapping and modeling and simulation that are generic, whether you're talking about a, a bird or a rat uh, or a person or a robot. Um, and that, that, and that those, those, those aspects of the generic aspects are, are probably, you know, are, are, are right, can be understood. But within that and around that, all of the different modes of intelligences that might be applied based on different kinds of sensing, different kinds of embodiment um, are quite open. Um, I think even more open than just animal. I mean, you know, I've mentioned Stanislaw Lem, but his, his, his famous novel Solaris is based on the premise of a, a, a planet whose ocean, which covers the surface of the planet is actually in essence a giant brain uh, the whole planet is a brain um, that is this intelligent thing that ends up tormenting the cosmonauts who come nearby. But it, it's certain that especially if, especially if general intelligence has some generic qualities, and the work of the Iranian philosopher Reza Nagarastani is probably state of the art on this stuff at this point, philosophically speaking, um, 
that it could exist on lots of different material substrates, animal, vegetable, mineral. And that would include at the very least, at the very least, a diversity of different modes of animal existence. And so, you know, how birds think, how cephalopods think, um, how ant colonies produce a form of social intelligence by which in each organism functions a bit more like a neuron that produces this aggregate intelligence in the form of the swarm in the form of the hive. This is all part of the question of what, what intelligence is as a planetary phenomenon. Um, at the same time, humans have this gigantic neocortex that is unlike other animals. Uh, and we have a capacity for semantic symbolic language that as far as we know, other animals, even dolphins don't have. So there are things because there is a range of difference in different kinds of intelligences, there are ways in which humans are also different from other things. Um, and certain things we identify with sapience um, seem to, we not necessarily have a monopoly, uh, not only have an exclusive, not only experience exclusively, um, but I think it's fair to say that we are, uh, that we, we have a kind of, a, we, we have a, a certain degree of, of, for better and worse, a kind of apex cognitive capacity, though that's, that's not that there's something that certainly can be abdicated and distributed in other kinds of, other kinds of ways. Um, but I guess the way I think about this is like, if you, if, you, it, if you accept on some degree, the principle of anthropogenic climate change, the human generated climate change and the general idea of the Anthropocene, which you could subdivide into other things of Capitalocene, Cthulhocene, whatever you like, depending on where you put the start date, there is a way in which that sapience and that intelligence has, has had an agency at planetary scale of which it was unaware. That it was acting, it was transforming, terraforming the planet in ways in which it wasn't aware of its own, it wasn't aware of what it was doing. I think the question now is for that sapience to, now that with climate science, it becomes possible for the sapience to comprehend the scope of its agency, to comprehend the scope of anthropogenic terraforming agency that has already happened. And therefore it becomes possible for it to orient and calibrate anthropogenic terraforming agency in the future. I don't think the solution is, I, I think that that part of it is to understand the, the material planetary biological conditions of its own sapience and its emergence and its connections and spectral relations with other forms of intelligence. But the idea that I think that this form of sapience should now somehow abdicate or take its hands off the steering wheel at this moment, that this would be the proper response to anthropogenic climate change is to subtract anthropogenic agency altogether would be extraordinarily irresponsible. Um, a basically equivalent to driving the train, almost driving the entire train into a mountain. And then at the very last minute, taking your hands off the steering wheel and say, well, I, I no, it's no longer my turn to drive. Uh, and then the whole, and the whole thing smashes. I, I think the, the, this, the, as the sapience becomes aware of its own capacities and now needs to learn how to wield them uh, in ways that are, will allow for the deep time of the future uh, and the long-term existence of complex intelligence to actually, is actually survive. Uh, so we have a question from um, Emmanuel Coe, who was going to ask the question. I should just introduce Emmanuel saying that he is one of the, he's uh, from Singapore, studied AADRL, did a PhD in uh, Lausanne and uh, is now um, uh, on AI and is now in Singapore and uh, was I think the author of the probably the first book on AI I'm not sure on architecture because we also have Wan Yu He who was also in Chinese but produced the book and you actually have myself so you've got the three first people to write on AI and architecture here uh, Manuel would you like to ask a question all right thanks Neil uh, yeah hi hi Benjamin um, so uh, my question is you mentioned about this um, inverse uncanny valley so you're probably familiar with uh, what uh, Aaron has been, uh, mentioned. He said this, uh, this idea of the uncanny reach, but, uh, and he drew this diagram, right? This reach where the big gun is at the top and then you have the style gun at the bottom and the uh, less performative AI models uh, at the other bottom. And so diagrammatically, it looks like an inverse uncanny valley and call it, he calls it the uncanny reach. And he suggests that this, uh, the new a the new gan based aesthetics is essentially about arriving and maintaining at 
on that reach where this kind of uh, unfamiliarity is sort of desired by AI artists such as he referred to Mario Klingerman and even Sophia Crispo uh, mentioned, refer back to him uh, as a, a, referring back to this idea of a kind of a GAN aesthetics. And yep. so I'm wondering if you may have thoughts about that and even uh, in relation to what your colleague in Stelka, uh, Lev Manovich, uh, wrote about AI aesthetics, uh, aesthetics as well. So yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, I think there's a, there's a, it's an interesting question to relate these two to one another. Uh, one, one referring to one connotation for this term, which would, as you suggest, refer to a kind of the calibration of novelty uh, and the cal calibration of you know, newness or what, it, what appears to be a kind of um, uh, a leg a, like a, a legible amount of difference within a kind of process that would, that would, that would take that would take the artifact that is produced by this to to be registered as something um yeah something novel uh which obviously are, are which what our brains are always looking for is trying to find novelty within this environment which, but doesn't arrive at some question of garble or noise or mishmash or horror uh or or, or grotesque um grotesque noise in one way in a way or another um on the, on the other hand, the way I'm defining it has more to do with this kind of seeing yourself from the outside, seeing one's own self as not as you imagine yourself to be, but as the alien perspective sees you and for you to be unnerved by your own appearance and for you to have a moment of you not recognizing yourself in your own reflection. I mean, perhaps we've all had this moment after a night of too much partying where you look in the mirror and you don't recognize the person that you see there and you're a bit unnerved by this moment of, of, re res of resolution that this reflection actually is you. Um, I, I think that this, the way in which any of us individually or optically, perceptually, phenomenologically might see ourselves through the eyes of the AI can contribute in this way. But there's also ways in which as a society, as a species, as a civilizational project, that we might see ourselves through the, this externalization, this external mapping that would in essence show us what we are, not what we imagine ourselves to be in ways that could be very productive. And in essence, that's kind of what you want AI to do in principle. Like if you're using, if you're using large scale ML models on for a big data project, you're trying to find patterns. You're, you're using AI as an external as a prosthetic externalization of this pattern recognition process that is fundamental to our intelligence, so as to find patterns that we could not normally see because the cause and effect relationships are too complex, because the time intervals are too long or too short, or because there's variables we wouldn't intuit. But the whole point of it is for it to see patterns we didn't know we were looking for, we didn't know to look for because we don't see the world that way. And so we didn't think that we didn't even think to see that kind of pattern, that the pattern may have existed since the beginning of time, but we never learned, we never were able to see that pattern because we didn't have the cognitive prosthetic of AI that can see the pattern one way or another. So as a pattern recognition device, this is its function. Now the, the problem with this sometimes comes from, sometimes it'll find patterns that suggest that might suggest to us that the AI is broken in some way, that it might decide by looking at a lot of the data that in fact, uh, that World War II was caused by a uh, Charlie Chaplin movie, that, that actually the movie caused the war or that, that the Vietnam War was caused by the Hindenburg disaster, that it comes to some kind of cause and effect relationship that seems so impossible and so implausible that we're confronted with a kind of ontological uncertainty in relationship to how we would interpret this interpretation. Do we accede to this and say, all right, well, the AI has found this pattern in the world that we didn't know to think through, and now we need to retrain our th own thinking in relationship to its conclusion? Or do we not accept it at face value and we say, no, this it's broken, it, it's misunderstanding the world, and, and like not knowing whether to whether to undertake it, whether to not knowing whether to, in essence, to act upon this interpretation is will be kind of, I think, one of the continuing paradoxes as as AI becomes more uh, is given more and more governing roles 
uh, in which to in which to play. Uh, and I, I think this question of how it is we use it to reorient our thinking in relation to what it sees or or vice versa will be will be only get only more compl complicated. Um, now, so I think I get in a certain sense, I suppose this links back to this question of novelty and the question of the, the question of aesthetics as a different kind of interpretation of this, um, of trying to calibrate this in a certain sort of in, 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 a, in a sense. I, I suppose one of the ways in which you think about this in terms of the um, you know, in terms of GANs and, and all of this as well is, is in terms of our discussion of simulations is the role of GANs in, in I mean, GANs are, are built around attempts to, the reason they're so good at producing deep fakes is because the production of the deep fake is actually the process by which it's doing, it's producing it in the first place. It's trying to fool the other, the other participant that this thing is real. And so it ends up being, it ends up being quite good at it. Um, you know, I don't think it's I don't think it's necessarily too controversial at this point to suggest that we will probably spend a lot of time consuming media that we know is simulated, that we watching movies with synthetic characters, synthetic personalities, that we might subscribe to synthetic personalities that become with which we have a kind of paro the robot seal relationship with that we project, we project emotions onto and we believe that we're receiving emotions back from but in fact are just the performance of uh, performance of cues and that the role of GANs as a simulation machine in this regard or whatever you know what comes after them will be quite important and then there'll also be a similar kind of ontological confidence problem where in some cases we're not sure uh whether or not that whether or not the person the thing or person that we're talking to how human is it how human isn't it um, and in some cases, it might be both. I mean, it's you can also imagine, you know, you're looking at me as this talking face in a little rectangle. You know, it's not when it's it's not difficult to believe that someone might choose to have, maybe not me, but some you know have an have it have an, a, an avatar of sort, a mask that you wear, uh, that looks like a person, that talks like a person, that moves like a person, that has incantations of persons, but is speaking the speaking the words spoken by someone else. And that th this using of GANs and GAN generated reality as a kind of mask, which is obviously our oldest technology of identity, masks go back, you know, since the beginning of human, human culture, um, may come become an increasingly important part of not just of how we, we perceive what reality is, but how we present ourselves to, to the external world. Um, suggests all that everything I've been was trying to discuss in the talk about the shadow and the simulation and the management of the double um, will only become more critical to uh, how we try to grasp uh, and, and act upon act upon the world around us and think about ourselves as actors in that world as well. So um, there's a question in the chat um, from a uh, very nice question, actually, two questions. Alberto Adolfo Fernandez Gonzalez. The question is, um, do you think that we are simulating life simultaneously by default? And then the second question is, are we simulating or creating intelligence? That's a very interesting question. I'm not sure I understand the first one. Are we simulating life by default? Um, is that a kind of like, are we living in a simulation right now kind of question? Or is it more like, are we, the, is the process of, is like DNA a form of replication, simulated, you know, replication? I, I'm not sure I get the question. Um, on the second one, it's a, a second one, I think I do understand, and it's an excellent question, um, on the difference on, on, on simulating intelligence and generating intelligence. And I think this goes a lot to this attribution problem that I was we were talking about with the seal and with the avatar and the rest of this. I mean, you can consider the example of, you know, the famous example of Joseph Wiesenbaum's Eliza chatbot, which was doing nothing of just playing these stupid scripts back and forth, but people would pour their heart out into this psychotherapist chatbot and believing to have been believing that it was incredibly empathetic towards them when in fact it was really like a page and a half of code, just turning whatever they say back into questions. Um, I, I, I think it'd be, a, I don't think I would qualify Eliza as really a form of intelligence um, necessarily, though it, it, it could be. I think it's Eliza is more of an a language appliance 
um, it's closer to a thermostat that it just kind of will respond in a predictable way to the inputs. Um, though, if you want to call thermostats intelligent, I, there's an argument that can be made on this as well. Um, I, I guess I would try to reserve intelligence for, I mean, the term can be applied to lots of things and we probably need just like, we need about 20 more words to describe the different kinds of intelligences we're talking about so that we don't just get stuck on the trying to make one word say everything. But I, I, the, the Herbert Simon in a his sort of famous book from 1968 called Science of the Artificial, uh, Herb Simon, one of the found fathers of, of symbolic, good old fashioned symbolic AI, among other things, economist, uh, makes this fundamental distinction between the synthetic and the artificial, which I think is quite lovely. Um, the synthetic he is, is some, the, the artificial is something that, that looks like the thing that it's standing in for, but isn't really that thing. So like a glass, glass that's shaped to look like a diamond will superficially appear to be like a diamond, but molecularly, atomically, it's nothing like a diamond. It's just a superficial reappearance of this. The, the, the synthetic, on the other hand, for Simon is something that is like a lab-grown diamond. It is actually the thing that it is displacing. It just was, it just was uh, it was just ma uh, man-made, let's say. It was just, it was deliberately composed. It didn't just happen spontaneously. It was deliberately composed. So like a lab-grown diamond is molecularly, atomically identical to the diamond that you grow up, pull up out of the ground, but it is, was deliberately composed. So that's a synth synthetic diamond. Now, one of the Shelka projects we did last year called Sites of the Synthetic took this um, this device of Simon's and applied it to the question of the difference between artificial intelligence and synthetic intelligence in the, in the Simonian sense. So artificial intelligence in this sense would be, as you suggest, something that looks like intelligence, seems like intelligence, but really isn't intelligent. Um, and so like Eliza chatbot would be an, probably an example of that, or arguably. It would, it would do all the things that Perform the, perform the activities, relate to our inputs in ways that we have evolved to identify and link with intentionality and intelligence, but in which actually possesses none of that intentionality and none of that intelligence. That would be a artificial intelligence, whereas synthetic intelligence, on the other hand, would be a form of genuine intelligence that was deliberately composed probably machinic, possibly biomachinic in some kind of way that is genuine intelligent in some way, not necessarily in a human-like way, probably not a human-like way at all, but is nevertheless genuinely intelligent. And the, the distinction between the two probably is you know, quite vital in, in thinking through which kind of project we want to invest our time in. Um, and I, and I, I think probably one of the ways in which we might ensure that we're spending more mobilization towards the cultivation of synthetic intelligence rather than artificial intelligence in this Simonian sense is to be suspicious of anthropomorphism, is to be suspicious of ways in which machine intelligence is presented as being human-like, is presented as, as reflecting human self-image that's, that's in, in one way or, in, way or another, um, but rather the ways in which it, 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 it's doing something that is difficult for us to recognize, that we don't quite see ourselves in it, um, and, and, and it, especially something that's embodied quite differently, but that still allows us for a level of engagement. And this is what that project was looking at, was these moments and possibilities of engagement between these two unlike forms of intelligence. And so, they began looking at things like the Kasparov Deep Blue Match, where it's it's really it's not about the man versus machine fallacy, but about the bounded space of the game board of the chessboard uh, as a sufficiently constrained space of interaction with clear, simple rules of symbolic significance within the space of interaction that would allow for some kind of communication between these two unlike forms of intelligence. The Go board with AlphaGo is an exponentially more complex form of a site for synthesis between these two modes of intelligence, between human and, and, and machine intelligence to collaborate on this bounded space, not an open world, but this bounded closed world toy world. Um, and then I think 
what we've seen in the last few years is an exponential is that that is that next generation NLP models like GPTX or GLAM, the Google's GLAM model, um, which are orders of magnitude built bigger than GPT-3. This is a much bigger, still a constrained space, but a much bigger constrained space for possible interaction with machine intelligence um, through the device of, of language. But it's tricky because, because language is how the way we see the world, being able to peel apart what part of this is an anthropomorphic attribution and what part of this that, that and what part of this is actually evidence of some 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 form of an, an evidence of machine, genuine machine intelligence but also kind of machine intelligence that we can interpret it's not so simple um, but I think it's where I, I think NLP right now is definitely where the most interesting issues around philosophy of AI are happening uh, certainly not and it's, it's certainly not in the conventional AI ethics space. Uh, which I find to be basically devolved into a, a kind of very grim formula, uh, and 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 for uh, would perhaps cause of another talk. But this question of how do we differentiate between the simulate the, the simulation of intelligence versus the composition of a genuine intelligence that we don't quite that we have not encountered before or don't quite know how to interpret is 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 the core question at the heart of all of this. So thank you for asking. Uh, we have a question from Iman Ansari, who is in Iran, I think, in Isfahan, uh, PhD student there. Iman, would you like to ask a question? Uh, hi, thanks for your insightful session. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm from Iran, and now I'm located in Tehran. Uh, I have a question. How do you see occupant behavior modeling and simulation and emerging fields in energy research in form of political simulation as you frame. Yeah. Now, on the one hand, these models increase the precision that government could mandate and no rules. On the other hand, these mandation of the rules make the human change their behavior, which yep. may evolve through the time. And yes, in more extreme cases, it may mandate architectural design spaces disables human presence and action. More generally speaking, how do you see cybernetic totalism uh, in the field of uh, political simulation? Excellent question. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so um, I, I think what you're pointing at, so the way in which I divided, I, I'm sort of looking through this question of political simulationism would be it, it, the division of this in ideological simulation, scientific simulation and logistical simulation. I think that the examples that you have given would cross all three of these to a certain degree. Um, that on the one hand, the what might appear to be logistical simulation, simply about trying to model crowd behavior or individual energy use or something like this is really about kind op system optimization. That's about using simulations of existing systems, producing digital twins of those existing situations, and using these digital twins as a as an instrument by which to optimize and calibrate the phenomenon that it is simulating, which is maybe predicated on the scientific simulation, which is using simulations to find out what's going on in that underlying reality. Right. So scientific simulation is first producing a simulation that allows us to describe the conflict phenomenon that is happening. And that's its role is to stop there. So climate simulations at this point don't act back upon the climate. You can't use, right now we're not using climate simulations to change the climate necessarily in the same way financial models, which model the reality, but then act back upon the reality do. But the logistical simulations are primarily about that recursion, about how it is that the simulation controls the thing it's simulating. It's a device to optimize it. Now, any, for sure, and I think you suggest this, anytime you have a model that is controlling or governing the thing that it's modeling, this has political implications. This is, we, this is, govern, this is where governance in the cybernetic sense becomes governance in the political sense. Uh, and the slippage between the two can be quite uh, can be quite quick or quite messy or both. Um, and it can definitely align with the ways in which questions of the ideological simulation, which I take to be more kind of the closed semiotic universe of a particular 
ideology um, may in fact be the result of or the effect or the cause of the, that, that, slippage in and of, that slippage in and of itself. That is how to decide what the, rel- what the important things are to model, how to decide what those recursion factors are, what are you optimizing for, who's deciding these optimization dynamics, how they become encoded and optimized and, and automated over time such that decision doesn't need to be remade again and again and again. This is why the question of, this is why, I, I mean, I think these are open questions, but this is exactly why in the long run, I would argue that the question of planetary governance, and it's a question, is one that is coming down to the questions of what are we, what are we producing simulations about? How, how accurate are these simulations? How are they being used to optimize the thing that, they're, that they are simulating? Um, and what are these, the cultural cosmological frameworks that we are using in order to validate, legitimate, or conceptualize that entire process? That is the way in which all three of these simulations work together. So I, I, I think I agree with the gist of your question in a way I'm kind of restating it in relationship to the way in which I presented the idea. I think the other thing that your question points to, which is I think interesting is the kind of Hawthorne effect um, that digital doubling and digital twinning has in place. That is, it's not just that we're walking around the world and producing these digital doubles without knowing it, we know it. And so they become part of the artificial production of self-identity. Um, that they're not just, we're producing these things and then they sort of happen, but they, we produce them and we, we, we use them. Uh, they become part of how we construct and pre- perform those masks of identity or the way we strategize or gamify the world around us in one way or another. Um, in terms of the cultivation and, and curation and, and, and modeling of those external versions of ourselves and the ways in which someone might carefully cultivate an Instagram profile to present themselves externally in exactly the way they wish to be seen, knowing that they will be seen through this lens rather than this, rather than this profile simply being the, um, you know, somehow the kind of objective trail of, of experiences that they have. And, you know, that if, they're, if, it, if it actually were, it'd be considerably more mundane. But also ways in which people, you know, I, I had a student who was, now works for Instagram, but did a project based on this with, in one of my classes, which was how it is that, people will deliberately choose what to look at, what not to look at, what to scroll on, how much time to spend on particular things as ways of trying to deliberately train the algorithm to show them more of something else or less of something else than they wanted to do. And so it's basically where the algorithm is trained to basically show you what you want to see based on what you click on. The person is looking at and clicking on certain kinds of things because they want to be shown those things by the algorithm. And so they are in essence inhabiting this persona profile and using it and strategizing it and gamifying it artificially in relationship to the massive Hawthorne effect of the whole platform. Um, Hawthorne effect, by the way, refers to the phenomenon where test subjects who know they are test subjects behave differently. And so you're not not sure whether the results you're getting are are real or not. Um, We live in a giant Hawthorne effect. This is our, how we, this, this is the world we live in. And it's why I Part of which is why I'm suggesting that this question of simulation has deeper valences than just um, than than ones that are just logistical or or uh, or experiential. That that was a fantastic answer. That one, Ben. Uh, have you got have you got time for two more questions? I got one from when you heard, and I can ask. I want I want to ask. A yeah, please. Answer. Yeah, sure. Let's let's have let's go to the bottom of the well. Okay, so Wan Yu He is um, in Shenzhen. She is the CEO of XCool, which is probably the leading developer of uh, AI software for architecture. She's also an FIU DDES candidate. Wan Yu, would like to uh, ask your question? Oh, yes, sorry. Um... Uh, actually, I want to ask, uh, um, oh, okay. thank you, Bing Bing, and for the perfect, uh, a presentation and i want to ask people are are like us here we are very into ai so we are very optimistic about ai but some people are just opposite as as i'm working on ai uh, application in architectural design i always facing this kind of a question from the audience or from the 
partners or from the designer architects. They're asking, AI will take all the jobs. That's, I just don't like it. Why would I like it? So if you are facing such question, how would you reply on it? I just wondering, because this is a, a moral issue, I guess. And just like the industrial revol revolution. No, thank you for the question. I, I'll, I'll try to answer it honestly. I'll say that I, without having seen the, the presentation that those people are responding to, I don't know whether or not I, whether or not I would agree with them or not. Um, I, I guess I'll put it this way is like is that I, as, as I mentioned earlier, like I, I've, I've come to be quite exhausted and even demoralized to a certain extent by the, the, the what AI ethics discourse has devolved into, which I think is a kind of, as I mentioned, a kind of extremely reductive and formulaic uh, knee-jerk filtering response to anything that's presented to it. It becomes a kind of very simple algorithm by which to dismiss things and to misrecognize things um, in, 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 in defense of a kind of political determinism and cultural determinism that is, I think, itself intellectually indefensible. Um, that, that having been said, if, if we are to presume that machine intelligence and all, this, all the variety of things that are called artificial intelligence, I, I think quite clearly that in coming years, the idea that we would describe all of these different things as being one thing, uh, AI will be looked back upon as quite naive. Um, but that if we were to assume that this complex of technologies and approaches and, and ideologies is something really fundamental, like I, I'm not sure I would go so far as people who say it's akin to the discovery of fire, but I, I think it is more like the, you know, invention of, a, of, the, of, an, of the engine rather than the invention um, of, of the lawnmower, uh, that it inevitably is going to have f deely disruptive uh, effects, or at least, or at the very least, it's going to have effects that we would, we would think are positive and it will have effects that we think are negative. And it will have effects that we think are ethical and effects that we think are unethical. It will have, it, it could simultaneously, it, it simultaneously could make massive contributions to the, the inevitably anthropogenic response to anthropogenic climate change. It's not gonna solve it, but it could play a very important role within it. And it could also be the thing that makes any, because of the, what it's used for, it could make any kind of effective res anthropogenic response to anthropogenic climate change, not only more difficult, but all but impossible and everything in between. Um, I, I think that the, I think what's interesting about it, it in this sense is that its future is it's not determined. Um, it's not a foregone conclusion. And, and so I think anybody who would approach something, I mean, I think it's absolutely fair game to approach any project and say, Look, these are the things that I think could be potentially negative consequences of this of what of this project, and the and or these are the things that I think could be positive implications of this project indirect, not only directly but indirectly. I mean, I think that's the basis of good design research in general. Uh, you know, I, I think that you, what you want to you want to produce for design research at least, you want to produce projects that you're not so sure about, and you know, this is something I try to calibrate with the Stroka projects is that, you know, we don't necessarily agree with all of these projects in a way, like what you want to do is to produce a provocation or a scenario or a prototype that the more that, that you're not certain, you're certain that if this were to happen, it would be decisive, it would be a big deal, but you're not sure if it would happen, if it would be a good thing or a bad thing. And the more you think about it, you're less sure that suggest that you produced a research project that is worth thinking through. It, it's useless, I think, to produce a research project that everybody instantly knows, yes, that would be nice, that's good, and pats you on the head, versus, or a research project that is totally dystopian and shows how everything's gonna go horrible and there'll be zombies and everything, and everyone pats you on the head for being a good critical student. It's the ones that you're really not sure about in the middle that actually I think are the most productive. And so 
I wouldn't take criticism of the work as being, a dis they may mean it in a dismissive fashion. Like they may mean it as, oh, I read that AI is racist. You're talking about AI. Why aren't you talking about race, you know, that your AI is racist because, you know, it's, we, we know that algorithms are oppression uh, and this is the simple formula we apply to everything. They may mean it that way, but that doesn't mean that's how you have to take it. Um, I, I think that whatever project you're doing, whatever you're working on, you know, there's ways, there are possible futures for this project that could be very destructive and possible futures of the project that could be very productive. And I think that we need a much more open and robust and honest discussion about what automation is for, what the automation of cognition will be for, what the macroeconomic implications of this are for, because they all come to this question of what, what planetary scale computation is for and how and what would be the ways in which it could be deployed that would guarantee a viable planetarity rather than foreclose uh, foreclose a viable planetarity. And so I think the probably the way in which I would approach those kinds of discussions is to bake into the presentation your analysis of what you anticipate the criticisms are going to be, and even add new criticisms that the that the that the formula people would not have thought of. And, and talk about it as part of the future that you imagine for this project in such a way that not only are people more likely to accept your proposition, but they're more likely to, they'll have a different understanding of the framework in which your proposition is being made uh, that will itself clear the ground for your idea in ways that uh, otherwise would be more difficult. Thank you, that's very helpful. We've got an extra, an extra question um, from Biyana Bogosian. Um, Biyana is uh, currently completing her PhD at IMAP at USC. She's also assistant professor at uh, FIU and she's part of the Digital Futures Organization. Biyana, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you, Neil. Thank you so much, Benjamin, for the great, great presentation. I want to build on your comment um, regarding um, energy simulation and uh, currently the fact that there's a disconnect between the simulation and the, the real world. So we're inspired by real world scenarios to create um, a simulation and mathematical models, but there's still a disconnect um, with the hope yeah. of bridging the gap in the future. Um, I want to um, mention this in relationship to um, um, uh, politics of uh, environmental information. And uh, I wanna talk um, about this in, uh, with, a, with a personal scenario. So at USC, I've been working with an IoT uh, center. And for the past few years, I've been developing an AR um, participatory game similar to Pokemon Go, but for air quality data visualization. So we have sensors around campus. And throughout the, uh, throughout the last couple of years, I've been able to uh, create, uh, let's say, uh, participatory events where people are able to contribute to data collection, but also they're able to, uh, let's say, suggest um, trees or other, uh, let's say, contribution that they can have for imp improving air quality around USC. And we were able to locate this very high polluted areas on campus. But when I presented this to the provost, uh, they pretty much shut down the project. And they told me that, well, the fact that I identify, let's say, corner of Figueroa and Jefferson was the most polluted. And this was something that we could solve with, um, in, in, let's say, adding a sensor to the traffic light, which would then improve everything, was not a good look when they had tours on campus and parents wanted to invest thousands sending their children to USC. So for the past few <laughs> years, I've been trying to kind of identify these patterns on campus. Yeah. But I've Which, been shut down yeah, I, I, it, over and over you, again. Yeah, what you what you experience is is like a microcosm of a bigger problem. Yes, for sure. Yeah, and, and I've done this in different cities in, in Seoul, which air quality is very political in relationship to China, Mexico City, etc. So uh, as much as yeah. you are able to, you know, building on Yantic's API, which they release it sometimes, they don't. Or, and then there's other models that we can build on in order to actually bring the simulation world back into the real world and really start to think about mobilizing um, these ur uh, urban conversations and begin to reveal information patterns. Obviously, there's uh, policies that um, from higher up would uh, stop these maybe um, maybe sure. this investigation. So I was wondering if you can um, talk a little bit about the um, politics uh, associated with AR because AR since the beginning 
has been very uh -huh. political from uh, investment in World War II to, to let's say the with HoloLens 2, which was bought by DARPA. Um, and for let's say over a year, there was no public access. So, um, so I'm very much curious about this po po politics of AR and in relationship to environmental data and how we possibly can begin to think about ways of merging and bridging this gap. Uh, yeah, what a wonderful question. Um, thanks, thanks for that um, and lovely discussion. So, I mean, first of all, your project sounds really interesting. Um, I, I think that, so to be clear, like one of the things I was just speaking to, just to frame it in this way was, and I talk about this in a bit more detail in the little terraforming book, which um, is available for free from Stroka's site. Um, is the the role the 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 way the the potential recursivity of ecological models and the absent recursivity of ecological models? And so, this is where I was talking a little bit in relationship to the previous question, where where there's certain kinds of models, like for example, for the most part, ecological models that might describe the world you know, in a highly granular way, but they have no power to act back upon the thing that they're modeling, right? And so your system might provide a very interesting and granular and experiential model description of the underlying reality, but it's not a mechanism for the changing of that reality. Like you, it's not, it's not, the more people use your system, it's not gonna make the air quality better just by using the system, there has to be some other second step by which the implications of the model act back upon the thing being modeled. And so what I talk about in the book a little bit is that we see, and I mentioned this very briefly a few minutes before, we talk about this a lot in relation to financial models as another example where, you know, Donald, Donald McKenzie book, An Engine, Not a Camera, um, is probably the, the, the most well-known book of the, on this type that talks about the ways in which financial models don't just describe an underlying market conditions, but they, in essence, are acting back upon the model conditions that they're describing in ways both deliberate and undeliberate, but that the model is a participant in this system. And one way to think about it in the most broadest sense is, is, is in, and there's lots of ways in this could work and some would be good and some would be bad, ways in which ecological and climate models would have some kind of sovereign capacity to be recursive that their model, not only of what is happening, but the model of what is likely to happen in the future would in a way bend back upon the thing being modeled in such a way that they would have this, they would have a closure of the loop to a certain, to a certain kind of degree. Um, and there's lots of ways that could happen. It could be a literal cybernetic loop, but it could also be, you think about the way in which like insurance works, where insurance is a model of the future like if you were going to give insurance to this person and they're going to build a copper mine or whatever, and like well, these are the risks involved in the future for this thing that they're going to do. And we will price the future based on what we think is likely to happen, which then recursively comes back and prices as the thing that happens in the present. So there's another way in which the future bends back and proves the model. And so I think there's these, these two channels of recursion that we need to be thinking about. One is how can the model itself act back upon the modeled? And also how the future can act back upon the present, which are not the same thing, but they can be, they can be closely related. Um, now, the, the, the politics of this, as you describe, is fascinating. Um, yeah, I mean, you can imagine like, I mean, in the long run, we might come back and think about the kind of decision that the administration makes of like, we don't want environmental sensors here because the, what is disclosed might be disconcerting to the parents. You can imagine a future in which you might walk around in places and says like, you mean you don't have environmental sensors? That's not safe. Why would I send my kid to a school that doesn't even have environmental sensors to, to know whether the air quality is safe? It's like saying nobody has to wear a seatbelt when you come here or something like that. How is that gonna make everybody feel safe? And so maybe it's a weird transitional moment we kind of have, but the politics of this scale all the way up to the top. Like I remember the US embassy in, in, in China used to post, used to take temperature and air quality measurements outside its door and post it to the website um, of, the, of, of, of the US embassy in China. And eventually, you know, the Chinese government said, we don't want you to do that anymore and made the claim in essence that, you know, that's proprietary information. 
that weather is our weather and you don't have the right to model our weather. Um, and so the politics of this and the jurisdictions of this as well, of also like who gets to model what and who has the right to model to the, this, the, the, and this is I think more generally part of this hemispherical stacks thesis is that this co competition over the right to produce data about particular people, places and things is becoming the basis by which sovereign jurisdictional claims are made in general. It's not just a particular phenomenon, but I mean, think about like the US Huawei controversy about US didn't want people using Huawei routers because this would allow, as they thought about it, Chinese government to use those routers to model, to, to produce data and model the data about things that people were doing in the United States. It's a similar kind of thing. Like we, that the, what Beijing says, that's our weather. United States says, no, that's our user behavior. You're not allowed to model this user behavior. What I'm suggesting is that, the, that, that this politics of who gets to produce data about what is what you saw as a microcosm at USC is also like welcome to geopolitics in the 2020, in the 21st century. That, that's, that's where it all, that's what it's all kind of comes down to at this, at, at this point. Um, the argument I would make, honestly, to the administration, and I'm not sure how receptive they would be to this because I deal with the university administrations all the time, is, is again, it's the other way around, that, that parents will be safer, that if you show them that even if, even if they don't even look at the data, that if you show them that they have environmental sensors on campus, that they will feel more comfortable than, you know, going to, have, sending their kid to USC campus, which is, you know, it's a, it, it is, uh, you know, it's, it's not in Malibu. Uh, it's in a part of town that's, you know, that it says there's a weird juxtaposition between the social ambiance of the campus and that of the surrounding area. And so anyway, I'm just saying it's like, maybe there's another argument to be made around that point. So, but anyway, good luck with it. Um, but again, maybe the long-term thing to think about is how, a pro what would be the version of the, what would be the second half of your platform? The version of what would it need to be connected to in order for it to be able to affect the thing that it is monitoring, not, not just draw a picture of it. Uh, ben, okay, just a couple of comments from the chat, and then I will ask my final question. Uh, yep. Ji Shen, who is a, a PhD yep. student from Shanghai, but actually studying in Amsterdam, points out that Chinese people refer to the data provided by the USA to argue for a better environment, which is which is good news. Wait, say, uh, say, say, could, you, could you repeat that? I didn't quite get the point. Yeah, Chinese people refer to the data provided by the by by the United States to argue for a better environment. So people are actually oh, I using see, it. I see. Yeah, yeah. So they use this, the external data as a, as a as a legitimate model, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, at a certain point, it's I mean, it, it's the weather is the weather, and the temperature is the temperature, and the air, you know, the, the the amount of particulate matter in the atmosphere just is, you know, whether or not it's being modeled by the U.S. or the Chinese or the Belgians or the Swiss or whatever. It, it's the underlying reality doesn't change. But I think, but what's strange here is that um, is the way in which this, in this case, I would say the scientific simulationism and the ideological simulationism kind of, you know, are co collaborating uh, or get, get mixed up with one another quite, quite directly. But yeah, thank you. I, I would say, I would say that the inverse is not necessarily true in the United States, unfortunately. Like I, I, there was not a big movement in the United States that says, I want my Huawei phone, damn it. And like, I want China to be modeling my behavior because th that will allow us to have better insights that this, this was not a big social movement in the United States for better or worse. So just one comment also from Matt Gorbe. Um, the difference between, he's talking about the, the simulated, uh, the um, yeah, synthetic diamond and, 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 and versus the question of intelligence. She says, the difference is we know how a real diamond is and we can define it absolutely we can't do that with intelligence, which I think is a great. I point. totally agree. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, I, I completely agree, um, and it's it is an excellent point, and, and it's one. However, though, perhaps in, again, I think in the pro, and this goes again back to, because a sort of a foundational idea within philosophy of AI, even before it was even called philosophy of AI. I mean, at least back to Leibniz, is that in this modeling and artificialization or syntheticization of intelligence that we. It, in principle, this becomes a, this as an epistemological technology. This allows us to understand, or at least, or conceptualize what intelligence is, in ways we wouldn't have been able to do before. And so, 
you're correct. It's not like we know what intelligence is and now we're going to make a synthetic version of it. It's we're going to make a synthetic version of it. And through that, we may have better understandings of what intelligence is. So it's it, in a way, it's sort of the, 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 the inverse process, but it's an excellent point. So can I finish off with a final question? This has been a fantastic discussion, and I'm going to say fantastic. Um, that is to say, I want to ask a question I asked to, to Blaze, and especially given the fact you have a library there next to you of these books uh, by some of the people we're, we're talking about. And I, I would say that there's been some skepticism, shall we say, within some circles that, that those working in the technological sphere can comment on uh, some of these more kind of philosophical questions, and whether it's kind of uh, someone like Jeff Hawkins or or Joshua Fish, uh, Joshua Bach, you know, I mean, compared to the kind of philosophical discourse that's more established. Now, I don't share that, but but I, what I do think is, and I want to throw this at you, is is the idea that maybe there is this emerging theory of intelligence that's, that's appearing right now for some reason in terms of a kind of you know uh, uh, an interaction between these different sort of fields and it it, it, it seems to me and I, and I can't even put my finger on it my intuition tells me there is something from a theoretical perspective that is hugely interesting emerging yeah. do you do you share that yeah generally i mean i have it i mean i i, I was i read the jeff hawk and thousand brains book with my son lucian who's 13 and one of our our, our projects over christmas break was was read the book to him, uh, which I thought it was a, he has a kind of interest in neuroscience in general. So it was a, it was a nice book to kind of go through. And I think for him, a lot of this seemed to make total sense. Um, yeah. I mean, the, some of the aspects. And so I, I like all these, but I mean, you know, it's a simple, it's a simple book. So it makes, you know, I don't have a neuroscience background, so I, I can follow along with it, which I'm grateful for. Um, I'm curious what Blaze was saying about this. I mean, Blaze and I have, you know, he's, he has, he has, um, I mean, we we talked a lot about this, and we you know we have a lot of overlapping in our in our approaches, and some areas where we put emphasis on different things. You know, he his take on intelligence. You know, he's he will he'll defend a, a kind of Michael Levin version of panpsychism further than I would go, uh, for example. Um, and so you know, my take is my approach is probably closer to Reza's on trying to hold sapiens as someone something rather different qualitatively different than other forms of intelligence not just a further along a spectrum but i think these are interesting debates to be had I, but i mean it, it should have been clear i mean as someone who's in the humanities and philosophy I, I find the kind of two cultures suspicion between philosophy and humanities to be very destructive um and particularly in the art world for christ's sake is you know the the this whole, this incredibly ignorant and naive wholesale dismissal of science and technology as a intrinsically imperial and totalitarian and destructive phenomenon is just, I find deeply stupid um, on, in the literal sense of, in literal sense of this um, for ways I can kind of describe. And, but look at the same time, and there's ways in which you know, anytime you're talking about outside the domain of what you really know, you're putting yourself at risk. Um, and I've talked a lot, there's lots of philosophers, lots of people who know a lot about something really interesting. Uh, like, let's say, take Steven Pinker, who knows a lot about the cognitive science of linguistics. And I would, you know, read along this as well. But when he starts talking about, you know, the history of Western, you know, he talks talking about like the history of the humanities as something as this, like, he just doesn't know what the hell he's saying. He's just, he just, he's just talking out of his ass in the same way in which a lot of my people on the humanities and philosophy side are talking out of their ass. And so I, I think part, I, I, but I think that phenomenon is an effect, not of the intrinsic, you know, th there's something wrong with these people or that Pinker is like a, a weak minded person or something or anything like that, but rather it's a function of this suspicion between these modes of empirical and interpretive, imper interpretive knowledge. Um, I think that the humanities and philosophy that we need to be building and the theory we need to be building has to be based upon, you know, our real up-to-date scientific understanding of the world. And I think this theory of intelligence that you seem that you are pointing at, which I think has a lot to do with simulation, Hawkins reference frames, it's all about prediction and modeling and counter-modeling. Um, 
and something that's also fit, deeply physicalist, that it's like it's built into, it's a, it's a property of matter. It's a property, like you can organize matter in such a way that it's capable of performing these feats. It's less important whether that's uh, animal, vegetable, or mineral, um, but that it also allows you to have some differential understanding of different kinds of assemblages. Like, you know, I think that the argument that Hawkins makes about the density of the neocortex as the basis of on these cortical columns is, is it's other animals don't have this. I mean, it, there is something that is different about it. And so that's, that difference is interesting. Um, it is possible sort of points of convergence. But I mean, that's how I think intellectual culture works in general, where you have these accidental points of convergence and divergence, and they happen kind of quickly. But I think clearly there is, I, I agree with you that there is one happening, not just around theory of intelligence, but theory of intelligence as simulation, uh, model simulation. That is also a kind of physicalist version of this as well. Um, but look, there's versions of this that I think are help, more helpful than others. Um, Chalmers also is more of a panpsychist than I am. Um, you know, I don't, I don't take, I don't put a lot of weight in what Sam Harris says. I mean, I, it's not, I, I'm not like a wholesale kind of, you know, these sort of uncritically absorb, you know, all this kind of as well. But I think it's the dialogue between science and philosophy that that continues to be quite, continue to be quite productive. I also, but I, if anything, I think it needs to be much more international than it is. I mean, one of the things we're talking about is a conversation that is happening in a relatively small part of the world that's that's deeply capitalized part of the world. And so there's a kind of, there, there's there's a, a way in which, you know, people like Blaze, who does incredible work at, at, at with Cerebra uh, or myself or any other people are sort of in a position to think through these things. But there are, I, I think in general, the question of the, the, not only the phenomenon of intelligence is a planetary phenomenon, and it's one that has to be a, a conversation that's being had at that scale. Um, I think if the conversation continues to be provincialized into one part of the world, inevitably the conversation that ins and the disc and the things that ensue from this will be equally provincialized. Uh, and I don't I don't know that we really can afford that at this point. Great, fantastic. I think what we're trying to do in digital futures is to make it a planetary scale um, yep. discussion. And Good. people here, I can see Giovanna in, in Peru. I can see Harith in in Baghdad. You know, we've got an interesting group here. So, um, thank you. Ben. Well, it's this it's is, my this pleasure. Is... My pleasure to be part of it in that in that sense. I really appreciate the interest in the discussion. Really, really terrific. I I, I sense that this forthcoming book is going to be. Um, well, I, I, I'm certainly for architects. I think it's going to be the most relevant one. I can sense that already. And I think there's been a fantastic series of points. Uh, we are going to be uploading this onto our YouTube channel uh, to be, right. and I'm going to go through it again and again <laughs> and again, because there are some nuggets that you threw in there that I think were carefully prepared sentences, but actually were, were full of, of, of ideas that need to be kind of uh, thought about, you know, um, you know uh, uh, the world is all there is kind of thing. So, you know, this is great. Thank you so much. Um, and, Thank you, Neil. Thanks, everyone. Um, and uh, next, just say for everyone else, we've got on, on Friday, we've got us in Spanish language, got bio design. And on Saturday, we've got a session coming from Africa, which will be uh, from Kenya, it'll be amazing. Um, and thank you. And next week, we have uh, Jeff Henry, which I think is going to be really kind of Jeff Hawkins, right? Jeff, Jeff Hawkins, sorry, Jeff Hawkins, Jeff, sorry, yes, the, really, bringing everything together in an interesting kind of way. So fantastic. Thank you, Bev, for your time. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you also for the Digital Futures team helping make this happen. This has been a huge contribution and thank you for the questions in particular. So thank you so much. Once again, thanks everyone for the excellent questions and discussion. It was a real pleasure to speak to you soon. Thank you.